friends welcome to coding garden with cj welcome to seedling school some lessons on a saturday morning we're gonna hang out we're gonna learn some things look at all the wonderful people dropping uh angel at the top of the leaderboard with where is it right right there <laughs> with the 90s uh 96.27 good job um we'll leave that going for a while but please do remind me to turn it off um well here <laughs> remind me to turn it off whenever i start uh lessons um let's say hello to everyone um hello gamestep welcome hello julian welcome to the stream yeah this is a little hydration bot that i made i am really quiet um oh i can fix that sorry 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 check 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 this is a check of the microphone <laughs> I'm sorry if anybody had their volume way down. Uh, that should be better. Let me know right now, sh uh, those of you watching on Twitch, because it's way less behind, is that better? Is that better? Should I go higher? That is a lot better. Better. Better? Good. Okay. Uh, I guess let's do that again. Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Um, today is going to be some lessons. As you can see in the title, we're going to talk about HTTP. We're going to talk about Chrome DevTools Network tab. We're going to talk about Postman. We're going to talk about how people mention that I should use Insomnia instead of Postman. It's going to be great. Let's say hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, and this thing is a bot that I made yesterday. So I was watching Instafluff stream. You should check out Instafluff at twitch.tv slash Instafluff. Uh, but yesterday he made a Discord bot uh, with... Uh, Azure functions and I decided to make one too so this is an Azure timed function and it automatically runs every 13 minutes to remind me to hydrate so that's pretty cool and hello Vilcodes welcome to the stream uh, hello said hello Merchan hello Tarun hello Neat uh, yeah tab mix says the class is free the teacher is late you get what you pay for people you get what you pay for <laughs> uh, what's up legend series hello Oliver it's been a while I'm doing pretty good uh, I'm all about teaching the peoples how to code hello Linus Hello, uh, Amin. Welcome. Hello, this is Tony. Good evening, uh, Aniza from Albania. Welcome. The mic needs more cowbell. You know what? I should get a cowbell. I have other uh, percussion instruments. Hello, Harsh. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> um, you were just finishing the f the previous VOD. Well, welcome. You're here. We're live together. Uh, thanks for the follow, Alilius. Welcome. Uh, greetings, Florin from Hamburg. Yeah, I think I fixed the audio. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm Heck. Hello, Tobzi. Hello, Matia. Hello, Marcus from Brazil. Abolish Saturday evening. Yeah, it's, it's Saturday morning for me. It's Saturday in most places in the world, I guess. <laughs> hello, Shirley Dev. Uh, I'm Heck. Hello. 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 Higher would be good. I'm going to go a little higher. A little higher. Why not? little bit higher and, and if i'm if i start peaking like if it gets distorted please let me know hello abalash <laughs> like i said gigan you get what you pay for <laughs> hello koketsu hello jamdi uh hello cheyenne um hello aniza sound is good thanks for the follow anyway hello tiger hello aj welcome uh hello my sunday affair hello vladimir <laughs> hello bob uh, Ab Abdelhamid says, I'm having a coding test on Python in after 10 minutes. I've seen some of your videos solving Kata's to train. Well, that's good. Hopefully, uh, seeing my thought process will help you with Python, because Python's a little bit different, um, but it's good to hear. Hello, Jax. Hello, Marcus. Hello, Boyan. Hello, Eds. Hello, Carlos. Uh, the link for questions. If you do exclamation mark Q&A in the chat, you'll get it, but it's uh, qna.coding.garden. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, yep, so there's the one from Boyan from a couple days ago. Um, and I fixed the login with Discord. So you can you have multiple login options, or if you don't log in, you'll be a wallflower, and uh, you just won't be able to vote. So Garden, you can ask all the questions that you would like. You're welcome, Shirley Dev. Am I interested in web design? Sort of. <laughs> so, um, it, it's interesting because I do build full stack applications, meaning I build the front end, I build the back end, I manage the database, I architect the whole thing, I run DevOps and deploy the whole thing. Um, so there are parts and pieces of that full stack that I'm probably not the best at, and design overall is probably one of them. Now, I'm talking about uh, visual design. So like, 
uh, colors, aesthetics, like what, what looks good to your eye. I, I do believe I'm actually very good at user experience design, which is um, the layout of the page, what the user has to do to interact with the page. I believe I'm very good at that. But in terms of like color theory and stuff like that, that's probably one of my, my weakest points. <laughs> Mary Chan, eh, oh, you're not on the leaderboard anymore. <laughs> um, but keep on trying. Good to know. Hello, Jax from Vietnam. Hello, Garan. Yes, those are the questions. Uh, hello, uh, Paradigm Shift from Orkney. Where is Orkney? I've never heard of that. Uh, is in the Northern Isles of uh, Scotland. Very cool. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. <laughs> um, GameStep is saying, what is the name of the Postman alternative? We'll, we'll list them, but uh, one of them is Insomnia. And I, I guarantee anytime someone's talking about Postman, someone will drop in and be like, um, have you heard of Insomnia? And I have, and it's cool. <laughs> but I'm very used to Postman, um, and I'll probably use it. Uh, there's also, someone mentioned the other day, Postwoman, which is an alternative to Postman um, with a very cool name. So maybe we'll use this. You have WebSocket debugging, a GraphQL thingy. Wait, there's a Rick and Morty API? No way! No way! That's actually really cool. Uh, I can use that for some of my demonstrations. Not that. The Rick and Morty API. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, I guess you can get like character information. Uh, yeah, let's look at the documentation. Yeah, characters, locations, episodes. That's so cool. Maybe we'll use this in some of our examples today. And if you have any other suggestions for uh, web APIs that I should use, feel free to throw them in the chat. Hello, Jonathan. What's up? Uh, Linus is on the leaderboard. Number two, 65.26. Right there. Oh, and you might notice, watch, Shirley Dev is going to land. The animation is fixed. It comes from where the seed actually lands. Uh, and that is thanks to uh, Andrew McLean. So... Uh, this game is called Seedling Drop. It's totally open source. And there was a pull request. I think that's his name. Hopefully I didn't get that wrong. Uh, Thomas Andrew McLean. <laughs> um, but it was a pretty simple CSS fix, but he made a pull request and I merged it last night. Um, and it fixes where the, the seedling grows from. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, Scotland. Very cool. Hello, Graylin from South Carolina. <laughs> Carlos says, I should be working on my Ionic app, but I'm seeing you. It's okay. You can ha you can leave me on in the background. Uh, Tabmix says, is saying, I'm planning to update your Sudoku solver to work on hard puzzles as well. That would be cool. Yeah. So if you ever tuned into that episode, um, it is on the code katas repo. Um, but basically, my solution will only work for boards where... Um, you don't have to guess any of the squares. It basically starts off in a state where if you do the process of elimination, you can determine one of the squares or one of the cells, and then from there, the rest of them will reveal themselves via the process of elimination. But um, for much harder Sudoku puzzles, um, sometimes it takes guessing, and my, my code doesn't do that. Um, so that would be cool, cool to see. Hello, Dong, welcome to the stream. Postwoman, yeah. <laughs> um, this is Tony says, I'm a beginner level web developer. Give me some suggestions to improve my skills. Um, there's just so much. So if you have a particular area, um, like do you think you need improvement in JavaScript? Do you think you need improvement in CSS? Um, do you think you need improvement in um, deploying websites? There's a lot. So maybe focus, focus your search. <laughs> Shirley says, I didn't think they had electricity in Orkney or even internet. Um, Hopefully that's not offensive to the person from Orkney, but welcome to the stream. <laughs> Duong says, Vietnamese love you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mia Yamsumi says, clearly curl is the best. We could show curl too. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is come up with lesson objectives. And for those of you that um, are aspiring teachers or you want to see my process for coming up with a lesson plan, we're going to do that first. And one of the objectives could be to use curl just to show that working. Buffalo. Hello, Kevin Grant. <laughs> Uh, hello, Tati. Hola. Um, hello, Tiger. Yeah, that seedling command won't work just yet. We need to we need to add that. Hello, Ashwin. Thanks for the follow, Graylin. Um, Gagan says, how do we become good at designing really interactive and good UI designs? It just comes with practice. Um, if anyone in the chat has some learning design resources, um, a lot of what I know is just from doing and using things and learning from the things that I use. Um, but there is a thing, a book called Design for Hackers, um, 
which I really like. Uh, you don't have to be a hacker to, to read this book. Um, but uh, it, it approaches things in a, in a, in a, from a hacker's mindset of like breaking things apart and understanding why certain designs work and different things like that. So design for hackers is pretty sweet. Uh, and then also there's um, not the design of everyday things, but um, what is it? I, I, bet, I bet if we just search for um, design books on Amazon, it'll be one of the top ones. Design. <laughs> uh, design of everything day things is not about web design, but it's super interesting uh, because Don Norman talks about like Norman doors. Like, you know, those doors where um, whenever you walk up to them, you don't know if you should push or pull. Those are known as Norman doors because uh, he, he talks about like, I don't think he invented them, but he talks about why well, it's actually a pretty bad design. Um, and he talks about like why handles are shaped a certain way. Um, let's look at web design. Don't make me think. That's the one. This is this one is really good for user interaction design uh, and really just designing like the layouts of page pages. Um, uh, so th those are the two books that I recommend. Don't make me think and design for hackers. So you can check those out. Uh, chances that post women is developed by a feminist. I don't know. I think it's a good name. Like, why did, like, is the, the, was Postman developed by a misogynistic man? Probably not. It's just a name. <laughs> we don't have to stereotype things. Uh, uh, Visceral is saying, in the same way, I use, uh, everyone asks me about insomnia, but I just use either Postman or Rest Client. Yep. <laughs> Hello, Visceral. Welcome. Uh, time to hydrate. Cool. This thing will pop up every 13 minutes, um, because that's how I set up the Azure function. Hello, Alana. Welcome. I should make a Sudoku generator. That would be cool. One day. You gotta, I think the drop has to be lowercase and you need to space. Hello, Salman. Good morning, Carolinda. I'm a ghost today. Just stop by to drop sometimes. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for stopping by. You have a good Saturday, too. Game step. Uh, Gridsome or Nux.js for a static site generator. I've used neither, so I don't have a suggestion on that one. Uh, Alana says, I'll try to join this week to the challenge, but I have an assignment to submit. Yep, so for those of you that are new to it, um, I started a thing <laughs> where you can um, basically create a front-end project, and um, I came up with all of the, uh, basically the requirements for the project that you should do. And um, it's a good way, if, you don't, if you're work, trying to work on your portfolio and you need, need a new portfolio piece, um, this might help actually help you create a front-end website. It has some guidelines on it. Um, and if you want to participate, there's instructions on how to participate, but there are a ton of people that have opened issues and they've submitted their projects. Um, and there's actually, oh, there's a new one came in two hours ago, C137. That is the, um, what's the word? Um, the universe, the universe <laughs> that the official uh, Rick is from in the Rick and Morty universe. Universe C-137. Uh, oh, yeah, and they're using the Rick and Morty API. That's so cool. <laughs> um, I I, swear, I didn't see that before I saw Rick and Morty API on the uh, Postwoman thing, so that's pretty cool. Hello, Goran. Uh, I live in the United States in uh, Denver, Colorado. And you can tell that I'm not from Denver because I say Colorado instead of Colorado. Everyone from De Well, for everyone from Colorado says Colorado. It's like, it's rad, dude, Colorado. <laughs> Hello, Omar. <laughs> Hello, Tony. Hello, Coding Pasta. Uh, can I explain Fetch? I think I will, yeah. So um, I'm going to start even before Fetch. So Fetch works on the concept of HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So we're going to explain even what that is before we get into Fetch. Um, so yeah. Uh, Graylin says, go on GitHub and look up code people have already pushed that you like the looks of and look inside and fiddle with it to grasp what's going on. Uh, yeah, I think this is a great suggestion for just like getting better at coding and um, also like getting better at design, like find the designs and the websites that you like, that you like to use and you think have good design and, and try to replicate them. Hello, Julian, welcome. <laughs> Uh, Kevin says, last time I saw your stream, we went on this tangent about this keyword for the for each array method. I remember that. Yeah, that was a good time. 
uh, Swagger or API Doc JS. I like API Doc because it uses JS Doc, and I like to build APIs from scratch and then just document them in line. Whereas with Swagger, you kind of have to define your API first or separately, like in a separate config or um, schema file. Um, but Swagger is probably much more popular. A lot more things use Swagger, I'll say that. Uh, Zrickmad is saying, 99% Invisible is a nice design podcast. Um, I've heard of it. Did it come out of, like, the Radiolab peeps? WNYC? Oh, it's independently produced. Cool. I haven't listened to it, but I've heard of it. Hello, Christian. Watching from the Philippines. That's very nice. Hello, Josh. Welcome. Oh, and uh, Josh uh, has submitted and is pretty much done with their project. They're just going to work on some, uh, maybe a different design. But you can see Josh submitted the My Launch project. Um, so Josh decided to use the Launch Library API, which is a API, well, an API that uh, lists rocket launches and the history of rocket launches. And you can search by date and different things like that. So this is a, a free and opened API that he found, and he decided to build a front-end website around it that looks like this. And um, here, it's deployed here. And so basically, we have our landing page, uh, and then you can, it's called My Launch, and you can find rockets that launch on your birthday. So we'll click Launch. Um, we'll type in a birthday. Um, this is one point of feedback I had for Josh. It's kind of hard with a date picker to choose a birthday. Like, I think you can, yeah, you can choose a different year. Um, let's go way back. We're going to go to 1969. Does anyone know when, like, uh, the Apollo missions happened? Were they, like, in June or July or something? Nothing. <laughs> but it's pretty cool because if you put a date in and then you click submit, if there was a rocket launch on your birthday or the date that you put in, it will, it will show up. Um, but so I had some feedback for him that what if instead of just showing rocket launches for 1969, you show all rocket launches on July 15th for every year from, from then until now. Um, and he, he might implement that. But, um, for those of you that are wondering like how difficult a project might be, this is pretty much all you would need to do for this, uh, project submission. Cause this, this satisfies all of the requirements. We have a landing page. Uh, you can go to the application page, the application page contacts a third party library, um, and then you get some results. We're showing an error message if we don't have any results. Like, this is great. It's a, a, a wonderful example of a, a, a possible submission to that thing. Uh, Coding Room says, I recently had trouble with a core's origin. I use a combination of React and Express. After a long search, I solved the problem using server.use. Yep, so um, eventually I'll talk about cores, but if you're in control of the server, you absolutely can just add the access control allow origin header to your outgoing response. And uh, clients will then allow uh, be able to make that request from a different origin. Um, if you're not in control of the backend server, which might be the case if you're working on this project, the not that one, um, the Seedling School front end project, um, there are proxy servers you can use which will add those headers for you. But yeah, that's one way to do it. How can I become a master of CSS and SAS within a week? It's not possible. You can't become a master of anything in a week you could you can learn about it you can learn about the basics and be able to create basic websites but you will not be able to master it um but if you're looking for a css resource i don't really have one um if anybody in the chat has css resources let us know uh have i ever set up a local kubernetes cluster with vms no i haven't i've really only um, done uh, docker compose and i've looked into docker swarm but i haven't really done docker at scale is my Electron chat window not working? It might have broke. <laughs> there we go. It was broken for a very long time. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, the Postman, Postman doc generator rocks. Um, I haven't used it before, but that's, that's another cool thing about Postman. You can actually create tests inside of it and stuff like that. Yeah. Hello, Yuan D. Welcome. Uh, is Fiddler dead? It's a nice .dot er .dot .net era. Uh, Fiddler was too popular. No, I've used Fiddler before, but I know it is um, Windows specific, uh, and Postman is totally cross-platform. But people still use Fiddler. Um, oh, looks like they have things for other operating systems. I feel like for a while it was Windows only. But I don't know. 
Uh, what's my opinion about Deno? Deno is pretty cool. I haven't used it, but it's a cool a cool concept. Um, basically, this is a JavaScript runtime um, created by the original creator of Node.js, uh, Ryan Dahl, I believe. I believe Ryan Dahl is one of the core contributors. Let's see. Is that him? Yeah, Ryan Dahl. Um, it is a secured runtime for JavaScript and TypeScript. So they basically rewrote, rewrote a, a Node.js style runtime from the ground up. Um, and it looks pretty cool. I don't have a lot of thoughts on it because I haven't really used it, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, Grayland says, about design, every web developer has different ideas, so that's why GitHub can be helpful. Free and open source enables anyone to learn and build from others' hard work. Absolutely. That's why, like, all the stuff that I'm teaching and p things that people are building, you can learn all of it for free on the internet. I mean, you don't really need a lesson from me. You could absolutely learn about HTTP from other places on the internet. Um, but some people like the way I teach, so I, I like to give lessons on, on things. Uh, what's the difference between Nuxt and Next? Nuxt is Vue, Next is React. But they do a similar thing for Vue and React. Hello, Jocelyn from Poland. Rad, <laughs> uh, Thanks for the follow, uh, Visceral. Hello, Chris. Hello, um, Asada Zaman from Bangladesh. Thanks for the follow, Ultrendo. Hello, hello, Ultrendo. Yeah. Uh, five minutes ago, friendly reminder to hydrate. Oh, C Sharp Fritz is in the chat. What's up, dude? Happened somewhere. I might, I might have missed it. <laughs> I am five minutes behind on chat. We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, the, <laughs> that's a good point. So somebody mentioned the 99% invisible podcast. Alka has a wonderful point. It's actually 100% invisible because it's audio. You, you cannot see it. Um, <laughs> Bob says, if we're explaining, explaining protocols, do Telnet. I have a presentation on it uh, due on Monday. Um, I will not do that, but we, I think we'll we'll start here. Define and describe protocol. So, like, what even is a protocol? And then we'll talk about the hypertext transfer protocol. Cool. And Telnet is a form of a protocol. FTP is a protocol. Uh, hello, Amon. July twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. Let's do it uh, to search for a rocket launch. July twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. July 20th, go. Oh, did I mess it up? <laughs> July 16th, 1969. <laughs> uh, did you did you really make that, Boyan? Because um, there, there are like a, uh, what do you call it? Um, a, there, it was like a meme for a while for people to uh, create like the worst possible user interface for entering a phone number. Oh, you didn't create it? Okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to try the 16th. Hey! Saturn V Apollo 11 launched on July 16th, 1969. Oh, and we can watch it? No way! That comes from the API? That's so cool. Wow. And if we click more info, that takes us to Wikipedia. That's awesome. Great, great job, Josh, on this website. Great job. <laughs> uh, July 20th was when it landed on the moon. Okay, so it launched on the 16th. Took four days to get there. I guess they had to circle around, find the le find the right landing spot. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, and uh, Cass submitted a uh, a news app. I'll show I'll show hers. Hers was one of the first submissions. Um, so if you go to Coding Garden, if you go to the Seedling School front end project repo, you can see all of these submissions. The, the majority of them are in progress because uh, I only announced this project like on Tuesday, but. Uh, Cassandra Goose was one of the first ones to submit, and she decided to create non-Earthling news. Um, so she's using the newsapi.org um, API, which basically, um, I guess if we go there, they have news from tons of different websites, and it's one API where you can search for news across all of these different news websites. And what she decided to do was to use that API to only find news that have aliens and... Uh, UFOs and different things like that. Um, so you can see her repo there. You can see she started with some wireframes. We have a title, we have the day, and it's kind of like a newspaper layout, which is pretty cool. Um, you kind of have your description of the app and then you see the latest news. And then on the application page, you can search, you can sort, and there's some filters. So these were her initial designs. And then she actually implemented it. 
So she scaffolded the first page and then the second. Um, and then is there a deployed link? Let's see, if we go to her GitHub repo, there might be a deployed link. Here we go, non-earthlingnews.surge.sh. Here it is. Tired of sifting through pages on, on, upon pages of news articles you don't care about? Uh, look no further. Get the latest news about our friends from outer space, sourced from all over the web with easy sorting, filtering, and searchability. We are not alone. See the latest news. Oh, that was a cool loading spinner. It looked like a like a, a crescent moon. That was really cool. So um, on this page, it's pulling from that news API, uh, and then she's just adding all of the things to show the image, the description, the title, who the article's by, when it was posted. Um, we can search for Tom DeLong. There's always alien news about Tom DeLong, <laughs> uh, the original guitarist from Blink-182, now part of uh, Angels and Airwaves. But yeah, so there's you can filter. Uh, we can sort by, let's go to popularity. There we go. Tom DeLong, most popular. <laughs> um, and then I guess we can filter by specific news outlets. So Vice News, Gizmodo, Daily Star, NASA, Area 51. Cool. And then we can filter, I guess. Cool. Yeah, so again, this is another submission and it pretty much satisfies all of the requirements. Um, Cassandra did request a code review. Uh, we can see, uh, yeah, so she wants a code review and a UI UX review, so I'm gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that right now, but um, the plan is I'll have a dedicated stream where I review all of these submissions and try to give feedback and do code reviews and stuff like that. So that's fun. I think the right chat is fixed now. <laughs> uh, Cores is enforced by the browser, right? Uh, can you bypass it with curl? Yep. It, it's a browser restriction and it's a browser security. Uh, basically, you don't want to go to some malicious website where it has a script behind the scenes that makes a request out to yourbank.com um, because that would be really bad. They could send requests there that would t take your money and put it into some other bank account. So the Cores restriction uh, restricts any website from making a request to a different origin. Um, and yeah, and it's it's enforced in the browser because that's what like regular users are using. Um, if you create like a curl command, you would have to, uh, and also like the curl command wouldn't have the user's cookies because the browser has the user's cookies. So yeah. Hello, Jorge or George, I'm doing good. Welcome. Hello, Sakthavo. <laughs> uh, can I give a suggestion for view templates like Argon design system? I don't really know what that is. I'm going to put that in the parking lot. Oh, there you are. Hello, C Sharp Fritz. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Six minutes ago. <laughs> uh, hello, Shintan. Hello, Slinez. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. I'm actually going to go uh, this evening uh, to like a friend's giving type of thing because none of my family lives here in, in Colorado. So uh, we're going to go play games, eat food. It's going to be a good time. Up time. <laughs> Uh, the Alcabot is not in here right now. Uh, but yeah, I've been live for about 30 minutes. What is the most elegant way to add an element, element to the DOM? I usually just have a big string with a bunch of HTML tags. I wonder if there's a better way. Um, that's probably the most convenient way to just modify the HTML directly, but there are security implications because you could open yourself up to uh, cross-site scripting. Um, so in terms of elegant, that's probably a pretty elegant solution because you don't have to manually create all of the elements. Um, but probably later on, I'll, sh I'll show that. Hello, Drills. No worries, we're just, I'm just saying hello to everyone. We haven't even really gotten started yet. <laughs> There's my hydration reminder. This is a horrible phone. <laughs> so if you hadn't seen that meme, there was a meme a while back where people were trying to worst, create the worst UIs for entering a phone number. But basically, this thing just like spins and you have to click set to choose the number. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, are HTTP and HTTPS different protocols? Uh, yeah, they are actually. Um, so HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. HTTPS is the hypertext transfer protocol secure. Now, I don't know all of the specifics of HTTPS, but it is built on top of HTTP. It just adds encryption features on top of it. It's live. We're here. <laughs> you're, you're watching this. Hello, uh, Blazer. Uh, what's up with the drop commands? Um, if you do exclamation mark drop, um, that's will you'll see the little thing drop down. And if you land on the garden here, you'll grow a nice little seedling. 
And uh, if you land directly in the center, that's a perfect 100 score. I can see you can see we already have some um, some pretty <laughs> pretty high scores already. I'm gonna turn it off when I start the lesson though. Cool. Uh, if you're interested in the Apollo missions, search for a podcast from the BBC called 13 Minutes to the Moon. They do a whole analysis of the tapes of the descent. That sounds super interesting. Yeah, I, I actually I love podcasts. Cool. The moon is approximately 250,000 miles away. Guess that would take four days. I would, yeah. But they got rockets, right? They can go really fast. <laughs> uh, how does DNS work? Um, that's a great suggestion for a future lesson. Um, we've, got a, we've got a few questions in here. Um, Pranjal, ask that question on uh, qna.coding.garden because I'll definitely get to it eventually. Um, but yeah. Hello, Akita. Hello, John D. Um, we're about to learn about HTTP. I, I'm just that good, Mattia. <laughs> uh, Pranjal says, I'm building a Node.js backend and want to allow requests only from within my web app when running in production mode. Is it possible to achieve? Yes. So you can use uh, the cores module, which automatically adds the access control allow origin star headers. Um, but um, instead of doing access control allow origin star, which means any website, you can do access control allow origin, the origin of your front end website. And that will at least prevent other front ends from making a request to your back end. That said, you can really never stop someone using Postman or using curl. Um, there are ways of detecting it, but you can basically fake most requests with Postman and curl. But the, the key is with cores, you directly set the origin header. Um, so yeah, if you're using the cores module with JavaScript, which is probably this one in your backend, um, you'll see in their example, you basically just directly set the origin and set this to be the URL of your front end website. And that way other sites that are not this origin will not be able to make requests to that backend. Express versus Django versus Rails. So Express is a micro framework, meaning there's not a lot built in. It's really just all about setting up uh, res response handlers for certain types of requests. Uh, Django is probably very similar to Rails. So Express is JavaScript, Django is Python, and Rails is Ruby. So Django and Rails are somewhat similar. They just use different languages on the back end. Uh, and Express is not a totally different category because it's more of a micro framework rather than like a full fledged framework like Django and Rails. Yep, and hello, Dirk Uh But yeah, there's a few projects already submitted, which is cool. What does horizontal and vertical scaling mean? Horizontal is this way. Vertical is this way. Hopefully that can, <laughs> this way, this way. <laughs> uh, and scaling means, uh, so let's say something is this big. If you scale it horizontally, it gets this big. And for vertical, if something is this big and you scale it vertically, it goes like that. I think that's what you mean. Hello, Blazer. <laughs> um, uh, Jorge says, I've bought a .me domain for my web resume. What hosting do you recommend for a simple static web page? Um, Surge.sh is super simple. That's wrong. Surge. So there's one. Uh, Now.sh will take a little bit of configuration, but it's also free. Uh, I, Surge is free. Now.sh is free. Um, and also there's Netlify. Netlify is cool because you can um, you can point it directly at a GitHub repo and it'll it'll like automatically deploy it. Yeah, coding pasta is saying Netlify is also great. So Netlify, Surge, or Now, choose one of those. Build something with GraphQL. I might. It is very popular. I've used Soap before, <laughs> uh, very recently too, because I was dealing with a lot of legacy systems. Hello, Mr. Demon Wolf. Nice H1. Very good. <laughs> Uh, John Sugar says DNS can definitely go down the rabbit hole on that subject. Yeah, we could talk about the basics of it, just like what it is, but um, it's, 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 yeah, it, you can go down a rabbit hole. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Boyan. Flask is the Python alternative for Express. So Django is like a, more of like a full-fledged framework. Flask is a micro framework very similar to Express, uh, and they were all inspired by uh, Sinatra which was an originally created with Ruby. So Sinatra is like the OG created with Ruby. And then the JavaScript people came along and they're like, we want something, but for JavaScript. And they created Express. And then the Python people were like, we want something for Python. And they created Flask. And then the uh, .NET people came along and they're like, we want something. And they created Nancy. <laughs> so uh, Nancy is the C-sharp um, uh, 
Sinatra. They're all similar in that they're four different languages, but they're microformat frameworks that work in a very similar way. Test. Oh, I guess Blink doesn't work. <laughs> um, do you think it's a big issue to dive into React before mastering the JavaScript language? I think so. I think you're going to run into a lot of issues that you're not going to know how to fix or debug, uh, and that can be a problem. So, yeah. Oh, I think they mean scaling in terms of software, not mathematical transformations. You're probably right, uh, Alka. Yeah, so horizontally... <laughs> I don't even know why I thought that. But yeah, you're, you're probably right. Um, but horizontal scaling means uh, you can basically take a service and just duplicate it exactly and create any number of copies uh, based on the amount of traffic that you're getting. So if you if you horis horizontally scale a service, you basically just take it, make a copy, and then you have some sort of load balancer that's balancing the traffic between a bunch of different copies. Um, vertically scaling, I believe, is more about just throwing more hardware at it. So Instead of creating multiple small little copies that can all individually handle a certain number of requests, and then you kind of distribute the traffic between them, uh, vertical scaling is all about creating a really beefy machine with like gigs of RAM and a, like many, many cores. Um, basically, you just have a very, very powerful machine that can handle a lot more requests instead of having to make little copies. Um, yeah. Nancy Sinatra. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, Nancy Sinatra. Merit Chan is saying, apparently Apollo 5 top speed is about 7,000 kilometers per hour, and the average to the moon, distance to the moon is 384,000 kilometers, so that's about 2.25 days with top speed. But of course, top speed is not maintained all the way through, so three to four days makes sense. Yeah, I would think that they would need to orbit it for a while, too, but, like, but I guess like orbits are pretty quick, because like the International Space Station orbits the entire planet like very quickly. So, yeah, I guess so. But I was thinking, like, it goes into orbit to determine when it should actually land instead of just, like, a straight shot directly to where it's going to land on the moon. I don't know. That was not a troll. I literally thought that it <laughs> I, don't, I don't assume anyone knows anything. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, sort of. I don't know. Uh, yeah, GitHub Pages is another place you can deploy your, um, your front-end website. And that might also be easy if, you're, if your website is already on GitHub. Um, you can use GitHub pages too. So GitHub pages, Netlify, Surge, now, all of those are completely and totally free options. Uh, Drills Kibbo is saying, that's some crazy stuff. So this is a marquee with direction down, and the behavior is to alternate. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for the YouTube sub, Tufan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hello, Maroof. Interesting. Um, I might talk about cores today, maybe. Hello, Mario. Um, you, we, I'm just saying hello to everyone. We haven't started anything yet. I have not worked with WebAssembly. Here we go. Here's Shirley Dev's elevator pitch for DNS. DNS is like a phone book system for servers. You punch in www.google.co.uk in the browser and a lookup returns the actual IP address, and then your browser knows how to find Google, the UK server. That is one of the reasons why it is usually faster to go back to a website that you've done before. Yeah, so there's some, some caching mechanisms in there as well. So if you've already looked up that website, um, your computer will cache the address so that it doesn't have to look it up the next time you go there. Um, yeah. Hello, Katoli, welcome. How to grow as a front-end developer. Just keep on building apps. There's probably a better answer there, but I'm trying to get to the lesson. I've been talking for like 40 minutes. <laughs> Just some testing. There you go, Jules. That's my GitHub. Hello, Mo. Oh, it was two marquees, one inside the other. Very interesting. <laughs> um, Merchan is saying, I think one capsule landed while the main rocket orbited once, and then they combined with the main rocket to return to Earth. Wow, that's some very complicated logistics. Like, it blows my mind that they were able to pull that kind of stuff off. Okay, let's talk about HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to design the lesson first. We're going to come up with objectives, questions we're going to ask, potentially some exercises, uh, and then we'll get into it. Um, so let's do that. Oh, we'll leave Rick and Morty API up because that might be interesting to show. Um, I'm going to show... Postman. I'll, sh I'll show some alternatives as well, like Postwoman. Um, we'll leave the Q&A up. Those are the chats. Cool. 
cool. I'm not going to answer those Q&As just yet, but I appreciate your questions. Uh, orbits are quick because they take advantage of the gravitational pull. Yeah. Oh, what kind of a marquee is that? Marquee direction left with marquee direction right. Huh. It's like a reveal. I like it. <laughs> Namaste, Sujan. Welcome. Disappointed. <laughs> I thought it was cool. Uh, hello, Carlos. Welcome. Okay, so we're going to talk about HTTP. Um, let's go ahead and just like pull up the Wikipedia article on it. H um, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. We're going to add that to uh, resources. Um, okay, so typically, if you're if you're someone that's trying to learn things that you know absolutely nothing not, nothing about, uh, start with the words themselves. So first, let's define hypertext. Like what what is what is hypertext? So we're going to define and describe hypertext. Uh, transfer. Um, this is a pretty basic word. I don't think we need to define this. Transfer is to take things from one place to another. It's not specific to the uh, the internet. You can transfer groceries from your car to your house. So I think everyone gets what transfer is. And then protocol. What does protocol mean? So we're going to define and describe hypertext. We're going to define and describe protocol. After we've defined and described those words, um, we're going to try to define and describe HTTP as a whole. So define and describe uh, <laughs> um, and let's see if there is a, yeah, so there is a Wikipedia on uh, hypertext and um, application protocol. Hypertext is text displayed on a computer display with references or hyperlinks. Very cool. <laughs> so there's hypertext. Um, the application layer. So now we're talking about the OSI model in terms of networking. We're not, we're not going to go that deep, but specifically we're just talking about um, like what is a protocol. Let's see if Wikipedia has just a protocol entry. Um, communication protocol. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what that's what we'll we'll. Um, that's what we'll settle on. What is a communication protocol? What's the purpose of the triple dub? Dub, 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 the World Wide Web. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about the fact that HTTP is the foundation for the World Wide Web. Um, it's not the foundation for the internet. The internet is just a series of connected computers um, that communicate with each other, but they communicate with different protocols. So they might use like the FTP protocol or the Telnet protocol or a lot of different other protocols. HTTP was specifically... <laughs> um, thank you so much, Casual Gameplay. Casual Gameplay with the huge donations. Um, let's read their donation text. Um, 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 here we go, here we go. Wow, wow. People just giving me money. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> casual Gameplay says, thank you for the stream. Thank you for tuning in, Casual Gameplay. Very much appreciated. Um, yeah, emojis in the chat for the for the donation. Cool. Um, but yeah, so HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is the basis for the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is the connection or the, the linking of servers that all have the same HTTP protocol. So the fact that a web server can um, serve up a web page over the HTTP pr protocol, and then you can click links on that web page to go to other servers that are also serving up web pages using the HTTP pr protocol. HTTP is the, per is the basis for the World Wide Web, www. Uh, ITCP, TCP, yeah, um, yeah, and those are even like lower level protocols. So uh, TCP and UDP are protocols for how the packets travel across the internet. HTTP is a much higher level protocol that works on all of those lower level protocols. Yeah, we're going to talk about it though. Um, let's see. Let me catch up on the chat. Hype, hype, hype. <laughs> um, Joel Skibbo is saying, I need to remember to get some time to start the project. I already have the ideas, have made the wireframes. I just need the weekend to push some commits. There you go. 
Uh, John Sugar says, for anyone interested, you can type nslookup, google.com, uh, into your terminal, and it will tell you the IP address. You can then use that IP address directly in the browser. Yep. Uh, and Google actually has a lot of different IP addresses, so it might vary which one you get back, but I'll do it. So if I do that, that's going to give me back this address, 172.217.12.14. Um, and you can see that I actually have my DNS servers set as 1.1.1.1. I had to manually do that, um, but there are different DNS servers out there. And, um, well, I didn't want to copy that. I want to copy this. So if we go to this IP address, it should go to Google. There we go. Very good. Is there another a super chat? People just giving me money? What's happening? <laughs> Thank you, Cedric, for the $2. It just says you. Maybe you didn't get to type... <laughs> you have more super chats. You are. We'll wait for it. Is there going to be another one? That could be an okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> you are. Oh my. Stop it, Cedric. Stop it. It's too much money. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to uh, 1.1.1.1, you'll actually see their website, which is from Cloudflare. Um, the free app that makes your internet safer. I don't know about that, but. Um, they are a very fast DNS service. Um, and if you've ever seen 8.8.8.8, uh, .8 that's Google's DNS servers. Um, yeah. And I don't think they have a website, but you can set your DNS as 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. All right, let's see what Cedric has to say. You are the truth. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cedric, for the, uh, the super chats, who says, you are the truth. Too cool. Hang loose, dude. <laughs> Um, cool. Yeah, so W is for world, www, World Wide Web. And actually, like, you, you can see that a lot of websites don't use that prefix anymore. Um, but people use that prefix because there are other prefixes. You might have seen, just as an example, like ftp.google.com. And that particular server, um, just by the name, you would know, uh, kind of exposes itself and has the, uses the FTP protocol. Um, or like telnet.google.com. But if you do dub dub dub, that's kind of like explicitly saying that I want to access the World Wide Web protocol, the HTTP protocol on that server. Uh, DeepSense is saying there are two types of HTTP connections, persistent and non-persistent. Um, we're going to talk about the non-persistent ones. I believe persistent is in like the newer specifications, right? Yeah, persistence. Um, HTTP persistent connection, also called HTTP keep alive, uh, the idea of using a single TCP connection to send and receive multiple HTTP requests and responses. Um, okay, actually, I guess it was in the older uh, HTTP protocols. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, I am specifically just going to be mainly talking about HTTP 1.1, uh, because there is HTTP 2.0, and it actually works, um, I mean, it's it's backwards compatible, but basically it allows you to open a connection, and it's not a keep alive, but it's a it's almost like a socket connection where you can actually stream multiple requests and responses on that single connection. But to simplify it, we're going to talk about HTTP 1.1. That's the plan. Um, I'm trying to learn how to develop machine learning algorithms. Didn't find any good place to learn from yet, and I paid for two courses on Udemy. <laughs> now I'm attempting to use Skillshare. Um, definitely take a look at Coding Train on YouTube. Um, there, there is an HTTP3? Wow, wow. Uh, but Coding Train has a ton of machine learning um, videos. He uses ML5.js or TensorFlow.js, and more recently um, used, um, what's it called? Um, Teachable machine, which is from Google, and, and that's not more, that's not a library. It's more of a web-based thing, which will generate your machine learning model that you can then use with something like ML5.js. But yeah, definitely check out Coding Train if you haven't. Thanks again, Casual Gameplay, for the tip. Yeah, HTTP, FTP, Telnet, all that good stuff. Uh, Shirley Dev says, think of the internet to be like roads, and the protocols such as WWW, HTTP, uh, FTP, Telnet, as things that those uh, use, that use those, like roads, cars, buses, lorries, and each of the different protocols uses a different type of vehicle. I, I like that analogy. Hype. <laughs> uh, so who's ICANN, and why did they just tell the .org registry to a bank? So sell the .org. 
work registry to a bank. Um, this isn't exactly related to what, what we're talking about, but ICANN is the organization that handles uh, all of the domains on the internet. Um, let's see what it stands for. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. So they're the official entity that basically says that um, 172.217.12.14 points to google.com. Uh, now, it's much more complicated like that, and there's a lot more servers involved, and it is somewhat of a federated model, but they are the officials. Like, they're, they're at the top. And why do they just sell it to a bank? Capitalism? I don't know. People want money. <laughs> Please stop. I'm having flashbacks to my networking class. This is this is higher level. As a web developer, you, uh, at least as a beginner web developer, you don't really have to know about the lower level protocols. But understanding at least HTTP is going to help you immensely for debugging applications and building applications. Thank you again, Cedric, for all of the super chats. Much appreciated. Yeah. Cloudflare DNS with TLS support, definitely. Uh, thanks for the poly, uh, the follow, uh, Poon Loy. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, Sujan is asking, uh, how can I go to the wiki page using exclamation mark W? So my default search engine is DuckDuckGo, and they have uh, bang commands built in. If you do exclamation mark, exclamation mark, come on, exclamation mark, there we go. <laughs> It'll show you all of the different sites that you can search. And you can see W is Wikipedia. Um, you can also go to MDN, like, and if you do that, it immediately jumps out to the MDN and searches. Uh, but I have that set as my default search engine, so I can do that. Suggestion for a full stack real-time application with React. Um, I mean, I would use feathers on the back end. I like feathers. I'm a bit biased though, because I've been using a lot of feathers lately. Yep, surely dev. Yeah, and 1.1.1 uh, is cool. Um, I have 8.8.8.8 set up as my backup, but I haven't had any problems with 1.1.1.1. <laughs> yeah, so John Sugar is saying, the triple dub just identifies a particular server attached to a domain. For example, www.google.com serves web pages. Mail.google.com could do mail, but you can name your prefix anything. Yeah, but um, I do believe it was the... Um, the original prefix that most people use to denote that this is where web pages are coming from. But technically, you can serve anything from any subdomain. It's just more of like a um, convention. Convention is the word. Yeah, and there's even HTTP3. <laughs> uh, my school's website doesn't work if I put www in front of it. I thought browsers did that automatically, so I'm confused. No, it's all about DNS entries. So your school has a DNS entry for this domain but they do not have a DNS entry for the, this domain. Um, and uh, because of that, um, yeah, I mean, I guess let, let's see what happens when we go to www. Hmm, I guess it redirects? Let's try it without the www. Yeah, so it redirected for me. I don't know why it didn't redirect for you, but there is a possibility where if they don't have a DNS entry for www, it'll just do nothing. It'll say like server not found. Um, browsers don't do the redirection automatically. Um, it, it's usually your DNS entries that would redirect uh, www to the, the Apex domain or the root domain. Yeah. ML5, yes, machine learning. HTTP3 is still in draft, but Firefox nightly already supports it. Wow. Wow. Uh, does the www prefix assume port 80? Uh, no. The HTTP protocol assumes port 80, but it can work on other ports. Um, well, let's add that as an objective. So define and describe HTTP. Um, we will diagram a... Oh, no. no. Here we go. Uh, define and describe the three parts of an HTTP request, define and describe the three parts of an HTTP response. Um, I think it'll be good to talk about ports. Um, and then actually, we may even talk about URLs because that, that plays a big part in HTTP. So um, if I take a URL like this, do you know what all the parts and pieces are? We have the protocol, we have the host name, we have the path, then we have the hash. Sometimes there's a query, um, but it's good to be able to break that down as well. Maybe we start there. Um, 
I don't know. I do want this lesson to be like maybe 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. Um, and it's probably Merit Chan because you have a cached DNS entry and maybe they added that DNS entry. I don't know. So you might try uh, clearing your DNS cache or try on your phone where that might not be cached. That said, it could be cached on your router or on your ISP. Um, but for me, it worked. <laughs> um, yeah. So, because the thing is, in parts of the HTTP request and parts of the uh, parts of the request include the um, server that we're making the request to. So you would kind of need to know about URLs. Will I mention HTTPS? I think I'll just I will just mention it. I'll mention it as a thing. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to talk about. And I really don't know much about the actual uh, TLS handshake and, and how it actually works under the hood. The, the main thing is I want to talk about the, the underlying concepts of requests and responses um, so that as a web developer, you know what to look for and you can start to debug these kinds of things. Um, I guess browsers might do that, but um, they are two separate DNS entries. One's the apex, which is no www, and the other one is a www subdomain. I can smell an eight-hour stream. No, no. I will be done because I have to eat lunch. <laughs> we'll, we'll at least do this one. Um, okay, so define and describe the three parts of the HTTP response. Diagram a simple uh, HTTP request and response. Uh, then we're going to get into the Chrome DevTools. Um, so we will say... Um, Analyze a web page using the Chrome DevTools Network tab. And while doing that, identify the request, identify the response, um, and the response part. So we're going to talk about what requests and responses are made up of, and then we'll actually see it happen on a web page. And say, okay, in this particular request, this was the uh, this was the request. This was the uh, path that was being requested. This was the host. These were the headers. This was the body. And then in the response, this is the status code. Um, so let's talk about that here before we do that. I, I want to talk about HTTP status codes. Um, list common HTTP status codes. Where should I do that? We'll we'll do that we'll do that here because after we'll we'll diagram a simple response that is a two hundred status code and then after that we'll talk about well there can be actually more status codes. <laughs> um, all right, can anyone think of other things I might want to cover on in on an introductory lesson to HTTP? Like I said, like we're not going to get in the weeds. We're not going to talk about like UDP or TCP. Um, we're, we're just going to talk at a high level as a web developer, what are the things that you need to know to use HTTP, I guess, to your advantage or to, to know how to debug web pages and different things like that. Um, and as an exercise, uh, given a web page slash URL, diagram all HTTP requests, responses that happen when the page loads. And this is going to be an exercise for, for you, the person watching. <laughs> um, so we'll do that. I think that's pretty much the only exercise we're going to do. Um, and then if people have questions as I do this, I'll write them down here just so I can acknowledge them. Query body param props. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> uh, don't forget to mention the T-spot uh, status code. I will. 418. And did you know there is 420, which is called, uh, which is enhance your calm. <laughs> uh, can we teach what local host means? Uh, it is it is technically the host name in a URL, um, which makes me think that we should actually talk about the parts of a URL first, but that can be its own lesson. Uh, Deep Sense says, I was asked in an exam what port number POP3 runs on. I don't know. I would have to look it up, but um, those are some other protocols. POP, IMAP, these are uh, SMTP. These are protocols for dealing with mail. Uh, but they're they're not HTTP. They're different protocols. <laughs> um, okay, let me know. I'm gonna catch up on the chat, but let me know what uh, 21 sounds right. 
25 also sounds right. I don't know, Surly Dev. <laughs> we can look it up. Uh, but yeah, anyone in the chat, um, what are some other things I should mention on this introductory lesson to HTTP? Please let me know. That also sounds right, Kalka. F21 and 22 are... Well, uh, 22 is uh, SSH, but I guess you could have FTP over port 22. Oh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, port 80. Um, uh, really, ports come into play when you're actually talking about a URL. Uh, because um, HTTP in a URL, so HTTP colon slash slash google.com, this assumes port 80, like that. And your browser adds that port automatically. Um, but what will actually happen here is uh, Google wants to be secure. So when I make this request, it's actually going to do some tricky things to redirect me to HTTPS. And HTTPS defaults to port 443. But your browser automatically adds that on. You don't need to put that on there. But if I put it on there, it should still work. You can see it just removes it. Um, but 80 is the default HTTP port. 443 is the default HTTPS port. Um, and you can use any port you want, but those are the defaults, and th that's what your browser will try first if uh, if you don't specify it. Yeah. To predict multiple outputs, not just yes and no. Yeah, I think um, um, definitely check out Coding Train and some of his recent videos with uh, Teachable Web or Teachable Machine, because he does stuff like that. Um, they they tr he trains a model to detect whether uh, he's showing an image of a rainbow or an image of a ukulele or an image of uh, a train whistle. Um, and the machine learning algorithm is, is able to differentiate between those things. He can also do this. He also does the same thing with sounds. Uh, when will the edited tutorial, tutorials be uploaded? I'm trying to convince some dev friends to join us on the quest uh, soon. I'm probably going to do it tomorrow. I'll have more time. The web is a subset of the internet. To navigate the web, you'll need a browser. Web documents reside on servers. HTTP is the only protocol uh, to access these web documents. Very good, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I kind of mentioned that, like, the internet is all of these computers connected together, but some of these computers uh, expose web servers, and you use a web browser to navigate between all these different web servers. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about configuration. Hello, Domenico. Yep. DNS is another application layer protocol. There we go. Uh, and I think I have that open. Um, the application layer, BGP, DHCP, DNS, FTP, HTTPS, IMAP, LDAP. <laughs> There's so many protocols. Um, let's see, DHCP is the protocol for routers to give out uh, IP addresses to all the, the, um, the clients that are connected to the router. DNS is like your phone book. FTP is file transfer protocol. Uh, IMAP is the yeah, internet message exchange protocol. So this is used for um, mail, email. LDAP is for uh, listing users. So it's lightweight directory access. A lot of enterprises use LDAP for listing all the users in their organization. Um, I've never heard of MGCP, Media Gateway Control. There's MQTT, um, which is a published subscribe network. Let's see, I don't know any of these other ones. I know POP is also associated with mail, which is the post office protocol. <laughs> That's great. Um, there's RTSP, which is the real-time streaming protocol. Uh, there's SIP, which is uh, session uh, initiation protocol, which I think is um, used for... Uh, oh, I was thinking of VoIP, voice over IP. I don't know what la what layer that is. But there's a lot. SMTP, uh, simple mail transfer protocol. Protocols. Protocols. <laughs> uh, thanks for the YouTube sub, Vabak. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Avi is working on a wiki quiz web app. Very cool. Yeah. I'll, I think I'll mention HTTPS. I just accidentally clicked. Someone followed, and I appreciate the follow. Did not mean to automatically acknowledge it. <laughs> I guess some browsers do that. I don't know for sure. Yeah, I did hear about Postwoman. I have a tab open for it. It looks pretty cool. I like it. I like the, the color scheme. I'm curious though, do they have an app to download? Um, because certain 
things we make requests to aren't going to have cores headers on them. And if they don't, this is going to break because it's browser based. Let's see. So we can see that uh, users, let's throw this down here. Um, we can see in the response, it has access control allow origin star, so that works. But what if I try to request something like google.com, which is not gonna allow origin star. Yeah. <laughs> this gives me a cores error, or um, yeah, just blocked by client client. Um, so interesting. I wonder if Postman also has a desktop app because a desktop app would be able to get around, um, yeah, proxy. Postman's proxy is hosted by Apollo TV. So if we use the proxy, that might might automatically add the cores headers. Yep, look at that. So that's pretty cool. So it's totally browser-based. I like that. Uh, click the plus in the URL bar. Oh, to install the app? Let's do it. We're going to use Postwoman. <laughs> Why not? I like it. Um, I do like that it breaks down method, URL, path. Um, we do have headers. Add a new one. Yeah, so um, header name and value. And then query params are there as well. I don't like that it's cut off. I don't know. We're not going to use Postwoman right now. Maybe I'll just use Postman, but we'll see. Yep, and which also goes to show I am horrible at estimation. <laughs> like every time I say I'm gonna be live for an hour, I'm live for like four hours. Uh, is the WebSocket a road or a vehicle? I would say it's a road. Um, and your vehicle is a super fast spaceship that can travel back and forth instead of in just one direction. Okay, uh, Shirley is saying in their analogy, it's a new vehicle. The roads are the wires of the internet. I see. So the wires are connecting everything, but the WebSocket protocol is your vehicle for traveling across it. Hello, Krisu. Welcome to the stream. Uh, I will mention status codes. <laughs> I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try not to stream for six hours. But uh, thanks again for the donation. Casual gameplay. Query body and param. Uh, we're gonna talk about the three parts. We'll see. I'm not going to talk about localhost right now, but I'm going to put it I'm going to put it on the back burner because I do want to talk about just URLs in general. And with URLs, we can talk about the host and what localhost is. Um, localhost is actually let me hide my screen for a second because I can see my host file and you can too. And in your host file, it actually defines what localhost is. Um, Make sure I don't have any weird things in there. Yeah, it should be fine to show. <laughs> so on your machine, if you echo or cat the contents of slash etc slash hosts, so this is on any uh, Linux-based machine, you're going to see that 127.0.0.1 is the IP address to use when someone uses the do uh, the host, localhost. So localhost is just a, a thing that uh, it's, a, it's a convention for our local address. And 127.0.0.1 is your local IP address like on your machine, how it, how it can talk to itself. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see that um, there's another entry here. If some application on my machine is making a request to this host, it actually redirects back to my machine as well. Yeah. Yep, uh, but if I removed this entry from my host file, local host would not work anymore. So that's why I was showing that. Yep, we'll show the headers for sure. Yep, and this is that classic joke, which you might actually get after that explanation. There's no place like 127.0.0.1. <laughs> um, there's that, That's written on like t-shirts and stuff like that. But 127.0.0.1 is your local machine. It's kind of like home, so there's no place like home, you know? <laughs> um, 22 is SFDV, that's cool. Hello, Flemish Hacker. I'm eight minutes behind chat, so sorry. I could steal some of the basic ports, yeah. Right here, uh, list common uh, ports associated with uh, HTTP and HTTPS. Um, I guess we could differentiate 
between HTTP and HTTPS. Um, that said, let's just look up HTTPS. And for those of you that know it, maybe you know it a little bit better, but um, because it is an extension of HTTP, all of the underlying things that I'm going to talk about in terms of parts of the request and the response are going to be the same. But what is the main difference? The main difference is that it is encrypted in transit. Um, there is a handshake for the certificate. Um, HTTPS creates a secure channel over an insecure network. This ensures reasonable protection from eavesdroppers and man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, but what, yeah, so security. The security of HTTPS is that the underlying TLS, which typically uses long-term public and private keys to generate a short-term session key, which is then used to encrypt the data flow between the client and the server. Different from HTTP. So HTTP URLs begin with HTTPS, use port 443 by default, whereas HTTP URLs begin with HTTP and use port 80 by default. HTTP is not encrypted and vulnerable to man in the middle and eavesdropping attacks, which can let attackers gain access to website accounts and sensitive information. This is pretty much all I'll need to talk about whenever we differentiate between the two. Yeah, but I was really just wondering from, from the, the aspects of how it actually works, there's, we should be good with just explaining HTTP and then say HTTP works in exactly the same way. It just sprinkles a little encryption and security on top of it. Um, but the thing is the majority of the stuff you deal with on the web now is HTTPS. Um, so it, it is good to mention. Yeah, because all of the same status codes are used with HTTP versus HTTPS. Um, I'll mention that when we say dif differentiate between the two. Cool. All right, I'm 11 minutes behind chat. <laughs> uh, we're, we're coming up with a lesson plan for uh, HTTP is what we're doing right now. 21 is control, 20 is data. Hello, Christopher. Welcome. Yeah, Teachable Machine. That's the one that uh, Coding Train talks about. Thanks for the follow, uh, Juanga, Juan Gabriel Ramirez. Welcome. <laughs> I was about to say Juan Gabriel. Well, Juan Gabriel. Welcome. Bucket. <laughs> uh, Pranjal says, when we book a movie ticket with Book My Show and select seat and go to Payment Gateway, the seat is blocked for a certain amount of time. How do we do that, like, in the back end? Um, it's a nice thought experiment, but um, I'll save it for later. It's a little off topic. But it's cool to think about. Yeah, so if you go to, in the U.S., we use Fandango to book uh, tickets for a movie show. How does it know to, even though they haven't paid for the seat yet, how can it block other people from buying that seat? HTCPCP is the Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where um, the 418 uh, status code comes from because it's used in this protocol when you attempt to make a request to a teapot that is not a coffee pot. And it will respond with status code 418 that says, I am a teapot. <laughs> uh, thanks for the follow, Sigur. Based on a certain CSV file, I'm looking for a tutorial that teaches how to use a CSV file. Interesting. Coding Train might have something like that. Uh, DeepSense says they were asked to differentiate between SMTP, POP, and IMAP. These are all protocols used in email, but they are different. Yeah. <laughs> they made the internet far too complicated. <laughs> uh, it looks like Raul has the highest score right now. The, the leaderboard is gone. Uh, did Chris, you just drop some french fries? That's pretty great. Was that on Twitch? Or is that just an emoji? Oh, that's actually an emoji. Very cool. Did not know that. JSON.parse is faster than rendering an object in a script. Wow, that's good to know, Harsh. Yeah. I should add a sound when someone hits the highest score. I'll do that. Hello, Juan Gabriel Ramirez. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Chrome extensions are potential entry point for malicious activities. That's very true. <laughs> you are correct. Um... Oh, Josh potentially fix, fixed their launch page. Ah, okay, enter your birthday. Um, 
1990, 07, 16. Wow. Okay, so uh, no launches found on your birthday. Look below, however, for every launch since uh, your birthday. This is not my birthday, by the way. I don't know why I put that put that date in. That's it's not my birthday. Um, I was I meant to do like uh, 1969 or something like that. Um, but so now instead of just showing nothing, we see there was a launch on August 1st, 1990. A launch on August 15th. Wow, that's really I like this a lot because there may not have been a launch on my birthday. But I would be interested in seeing all the launches that happened around my birthday. Oh, and there's another page, too. What? <laughs> uh, and there's 1,200 results. That's so cool. Uh, Drill Skibbo says it doesn't support the new emojis. I'm using Twemoji, which is like the Twitter emoji library. It may not have them in it. <laughs> Um, seven minutes ago, or in just now, I was reminded to take a drink of water. A man teacher. Okay. I think, let me try that. That seemed to work. Is that the right one? Hello, Miku. Welcome to the stream. Yeah, so HTTPS uses the secure socket layer, SSL. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Are you on Windows? Maybe it does something different on Windows. Oh, WM takes you to Wikipedia Mobile. Mobile. That's good to know. Bonsoir, Katul. Welcome to the show. Bonsoir. <laughs> HTTPS pitfalls like mixed content, HSTS, certificate, misconfiguration. Um, these are all great topics, but I'm not going to talk about them in the, in the introduction to HTTP. That's more of like if you're configuring servers and you want to do that kind of stuff. The, the main goals of this HTTP lesson are for anybody that's new to web development um, to learn about the underlying uh, protocols in web development. Hello, Conrad. Welcome. Uh, I thought Teapot was 418. Maybe it is 408. I don't know. Hmm. Thanks for the follow, init 1998. You should be able to drop Joel's Kippo. <laughs> uh, Paras says, I made a PR, but now I'm asked to squash the commits. Uh, don't know what to do. Um, you, you should be able to search for git squash commits. It can show you the commands that you can run. Typically, you might have to rebase. That said, the person merging your PR, there's literally a button they can click that says merge commits. So maybe just tell them, say, hey, just merge them for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, when, I, I don't know if Windows 10 does that emoji differently. Alka says, in my chat, I see the teachers, but on your chat, I see the man school, woman school. And the drop picked the school. I see. I see. I see. It is 14. Okay. Uh, canceling and interrupting an HTTP request. I think that's out of scope. Something happened. Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready for the lesson now. Um, we're going to have this dif differentiate uh, up here. We're going to add HTTPS in the resources. Not that. Um, oh. Um, can anyone think of a, an analogy for a protocol? I'm going to put application layer there. I am going to talk, I'll leave the hypertext one up. Oh, and actually, I'm going to leave the HTTPS, yeah, I'm going to leave that one up so that I can talk about it. HTTP. I won't talk about a persistent connection. Um, there's an example API that we might use. Um, and we need, we do need to go to the hypertext transfer protocol. Yes, 
Yeah, I, I don't exactly like the recipe analogy because a lot of people use that same analogy analogy for an algorithm. I mean, is a protocol technically an algorithm? I guess there's an underlying algorithm that describes how to use that protocol. Um, close the, well, I don't want to close the Q&A. We'll keep that open for now. An HTTP server is someone with amnesia. <laughs> I like that. Uh, diplomacy follows protocol. Oh, I like that. So um, if you're working in diplomatic relations, you need to understand the protocol for communi communicating with another person of a different culture or a different country, and you must follow that protocol or you could get in trouble. Yeah. I like it. Uh, and let's just straight up find the definition of uh, protocol. Actually, I'll do it live while I'm, I'm doing the lesson. But I like all of these things. These are very good. Uh, protocol is how letters used to be sent. I guess the protocol for snail mail or actual letters is the fact that you need to put the sender's uh, address at the top. You put the receiver's address on the front in the middle-ish, and you need to apply payment stamps on the front. And then I guess that's the protocol because then that letter can be put in the mail to be sent to someone else. And as long as you followed that protocol, it's going to make it to that other person. Yeah. Some rules both sides need to adhere. I like that. Okay, follows protocol. All right, let's get into it. Um, we're going to start, we're gonna start here. Just a second. Oh, cool. Hello, Kim, if you're still watching. <laughs> uh, Kim is a, is a friend and someone that I used to teach with, but she mentioned uh, she would like to help me teach DNS, so I think that would be fun if we had her come on the show. Cool. All right. <clears throat> That's a good call, AJ. So this is a type of protocol. Uh, you don't touch the king or the queen unless they extend their hand to touch you. Otherwise, you will be beheaded, and you must follow that protocol. Hello, a tool. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to attempt to teach this lesson. We're going to write out descriptions. Um, uh, while I'm giving this lesson, it would be great if you acted like a student and um, listened, but also feel free to throw in comments about the things that I'm talking about. And honestly, even if you mention them earlier, feel free to mention them while I'm giving the lesson because then they can show up in the in the edited video. Um, when I do talk about protocol, I might actually scroll down and, and get some examples um, and try to keep your side chatter to a minimum. But, you know, it's a free country or you I mean, I live in a free country. You may not live in a free country, but you're totally welcome to put anything in the chat that you want to. But for the most part, we're going to try to keep it related to HTTP for now. Hello, Batar. Hello, Atul. Welcome to the stream. Let's talk about HTTP. I'm going to redo that, though, because I need, like, an intro to the video. <laughs> uh, in this video, we are going to talk about HTTP. We will define and describe hypertext, define and describe protocol, define and describe HTTP, define and describe HTTPS, uh, differentiate between HTTP and HTTPS. We will define and describe the three parts of an HTTP request and HTTP response. We will diagram a simple HTTP request and response. We'll list the common ports associated with HTTP and HTTPS, and we'll list uh, common HTTP status codes. And finally, we will analyze a web page using the Chrome DevTools Network tab to identify the parts of the request and the parts of the response. Let's get started. First, we will define and describe hypertext. So at the bottom of this document, I have a bunch of different resources. The first link is to the Wikipedia page on hypertext. Let's talk about hypertext for a second. Hypertext is text displayed on a computer display or other electronic device with references or hyperlinks. When you look at a Wikipedia web page, this is an example of hypertext. Technically, web pages are kind of synonymous with hypertext because web pages have links on them. Um, and I just remembered I need to turn the drop game off for now. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, the fact that this Wikipedia page has links that I can click, and if I click there, it's going to take me to another page. This is hypertext. And this concept was first uh, created and came about in the development of the World Wide Web. Um, you can see in this image here how all these different web pages link to each other. If you click a link, it's going to go to another page. So that is hypertext. And hypertext is the H in the HTTP acronym. 
Cool. So we have what hypertext is. It's pages that are um, alive and can link together. Now let's define and describe protocol. So protocol um, is a way, uh, a defined way for things to communicate. We had some really good examples in the chat earlier when people were giving uh, analogies of a protocol. Uh, let me find some of those. Um, so this, this analogy of a protocol comes from AJ. It's totally unrelated to technology, but it's kind of the same thing. So you don't touch the king or the queen unless they extend their hand to touch you. That's a form of a protocol. You must follow that protocol if you were to ever to meet the king or the queen. Um, let's see other things. Um, and this, this is somewhat related. So Zirkmat is saying, like a language you might know, like Spanish, but not Russian, you can't speak to Russians unless they know Spanish. So uh, verbal communication is a form of a protocol. It's a way for two things to communicate. Uh, Deep Sense is saying, a protocol is defined as the order and format of messages exchanged between two or more entities, like when people are talking to each other. So it's a way to exchange or a definition and rules around exchanging information. Uh, Ultrindo says a protocol is some kind of contract. Uh, the contract is that you're both going to follow those same rules uh, in your communication and exchange of information. Yeah. And uh, a protocol is a, so Matias says, a protocol is a standard, like we agree to work in a certain way. Yes, these are all great analogies and definitions of the protocol. And uh, in the acronym HTTP, that's what the P stands for, protocol. So if we are to define and describe HTTP, first, this is hypertext transfer protocol. <laughs> so uh, if you remember, hypertext is a way of uh, web pages or creating pages that can link to each other. Uh, transfer, um, this is a pretty easy word to define. You don't really have to be in technology to define transfer. Transfer is taking things from one place and putting them in another. You can transfer the groceries from the grocery store to your car and then transfer the groceries from your car to your home. Um, that's a transfer, um, but HTTP is hypertext transfer protocol. So it's a proto protocol, it's a defined set of rules for transferring hypertext documents, okay? So that's the HTTP acronym. Um, and uh, and that's, that's what it means and that's what it is. So when you hear people talk about HTTP or you might be thinking of this, when you go to a web page, you have to type in HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash. Uh, when you're using a web browser, you are using the hypertext transfer protocol. Okay, now I just mentioned HTTPS, so let's talk about that. We will define and describe HTTPS. So HTTPS is hypertext transfer protocol secure, I think. Let's look it up on, on Wikipedia really quick. Uh, not that, that was the wrong thing. Here we go. Hypertext transfer protocol secure. Awesome. So um, this is a, a similar thing. So it's built on top of HTTP, but it introduces some security. So you may be familiar if you go to a banking website in the URL, it has HTTPS, or if you go to your email in the URL, it has HTTPS. So um, these websites are using the hypertext transfer protocol, but with an added security layer so that hackers can't see your data and steal your bank information or steal your emails. So the uh, HTTPS is very similarly the, H the HTTP protocol with some added security features on top of it. Cool. And so for our next objective, we're going to differentiate between HTTP and HTTPS. Um, and the reason we are mentioning HTTPS is because the majority of the web these days runs on HTTPS. Um, it used to be that HTTPS didn't exist. HTTP was the only thing. Um, and it's still good to understand the underlying concepts, concepts of HTTP because HTTPS is built on top of that. Um, but just real quick, let's differentiate between HTTP and HTTPS. So I have this Wikipedia article, article open on HTTPS, and in it there is a section on the difference from HTTP. So the first difference is that HTTPS URLs begin with HTTPS. So if you ever visit a website and you see that there is HTTPS in the URL, you know that that website is using Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. Awesome. Um, if you ever visit a website and it just says HTTP, then you know that it's using the um, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Not Secure. It's totally unencrypted. I actually don't know of any websites that, that are using HTTP because the majority of websites use HTTPS these days. Um, anyone in the chat, do you have examples of uh, websites that use HTTP and that will work if I put HTTP in the browser? I'll wait for some responses and I'll catch up on the chat real quick. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Deep Sense. So let's add that. Uh, quick aside, and thank you, Deep Sense, for mentioning it. There's no talking about the web without referencing Tim. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is actually his name. So Tim Berners-Lee was the original creator of the hypertext transfer protocol. Um, let's see if uh, he's mentioned in this article. Uh, yeah, so Tim Berners-Lee. So Tim Berners-Lee created... Um, Oh, that's Ted Nelson. I was like, why is he, why? That's not Tim Berners-Lee, that's Ted Nelson, okay. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee created the hypertext transfer protocol. Um, he created the first web browser um, and and basically created the, the foundations for the World Wide Web as we know it today. Um, so absolutely, there is no talking about this stuff without mentioning Tim Berners-Lee. You should know who he is, um, or at least know the name and know that what we're doing right now, the fact that you're you're watching me inside of a web browser, that's that's all thanks to this guy. It would not have been possible had he not done the initial creation of all of these things. Thank you, Deep Sense. Um, thank you for the follow, uh, Ashish Singh Bahel. Welcome. Thanks for the follow, MD Box. Uh, yeah, and there was a, a question from Ashish Singh uh, Bahel who says TCP is a protocol. Uh, yeah, TCP is a, a lower level protocol. So TCP, UDP, those are lower level protocols. HTTP is a higher level protocol, um, meaning it's built on top of um, TCP, I believe. Yeah. Atula saying protocol is a short set of rules to follow. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, TCP is reliable in that it sends acknowledgement. Um, it's potentially slower because uh, the clients will wait for acknowledgement packets to come in, whereas UDP doesn't care. It's just like a stream of packets. It doesn't care if they make it there or not. Um, the T transfer is a bit off. So, but the, the protocol itself, HTTP, absolutely is hypertext transfer protocol. And we're gonna talk about the different parts of the request um, because it is a way of transferring hypertext documents. I will say that. Hello, Himanshu, welcome. <laughs> uh, no worry, uh, Ashish, uh, but uh, it's slightly off topic to the what I'm talking about here, so we can talk about that stuff in a bit. And I'm gonna take a drink of water. All of this is gonna be edited out from the final video. <laughs> we're gonna edit it out. Hello, Jikochi. Welcome to the stream. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, everyone's a beginner. Uh, HTTP example.com. Does that actually work? <clears throat> cool. <laughs> All right, that's what I was. Uh, that's what I was looking at. And there's also uh, neverssl.com. Very cool. Cool. I like it. <laughs> um, Uh, yeah, so HTML isn't the only thing transferred, but it used to be. So initially, all we had were HTML documents. Then we came up with this idea of embedding scripts and embedding styles and embedding images, and all of those still use the same HTTP protocol to be transferred. Um, and the, I'll say like the one of the key words in here is text because it's a way of transferring text. And in the HTTP protocol, we transfer images as text. Uh, we transfer, transfer um, CSS documents as text. Uh, we can even transfer videos as text. Um, it, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing once you figure this out that, um, yes, it's called hypertext because that was the original thing. But these days, we transfer so much more over that same HTTP protocol. <laughs> uh, the, the MIT website is HTTP only. Let's try it. Cool. <laughs> uh, what was the first web browser? Uh, it was on the Next Step operating system. Um, I forget what it was though. No, it was not IE. IE came way, way after. Um, history of the web browser. Oh yeah, um, Tim Berners-Lee also created the URI, the Uniform Resource uh, Identifier or actual URLs. He came up with that. Um, 
Yeah, the first browser was actually called World Wide Web, and then it was renamed to Nexus. And I believe it was actually created for the Next Step operating system. Um, here it is, the Next Computer. Uh, and that was the first web server, too. Cool. All right, we've got some, I think that's enough HTTP. <laughs> yeah, and it, it'll be good to point out that the modern web and the search engines, they prefer HTTPS over HTTP, so I'll do that. I'm not, I'm, I might mention that there are more protocols, but we're talking about just the basics, the basics. Yeah. Yeah, not saying it's perfect, but it is what we use and people should know about it. <laughs> uh, cool. All right, uh, so where was I? I was in the middle of the lesson and we were talking about differentiating between HTTP and HTTPS. Cool, so I had just talked about the fact that uh, URLs begin with HTTPS. Cool. So as you can see, URLs that begin with HTTPS, those are, are over uh, HTTP secure. Um, there are websites that aren't over HTTPS, um, though those websites are slowly get going away as the majority of the web is now, now prefers things to be over HTTPS. Um, but you can see if you go to HTTP um, colon slash slash example.com, the HTTPS is not gonna get added. You'll notice if you're using Chrome that it says not secure. I mean, technically it's not secure because it was just transferred as text, but the website still works. Um, we can see uh, neverssl.com doesn't use HTTPS. We can see that uh, web.mit.edu uses HTTP. It doesn't use HTTPS. Um, so that's, that's good to note. Um, but typically when we're talking about the differences, uh, one has HTTPS, one has HTTP. Um, now in, in, in a later objective, we're going to list the different types of ports. So for HTTPS, the default port is 443. So that's that. what that means is when your browser makes the request to this server, by default, if you don't put a port, it's actually gonna do port 443. But if I put it in manually, 443, it should still work. Their server has a way of redirecting and removing that if I added it. But 443 is the default port for HTTPS, so that's one thing to note. And then for HTTP, the default port is 80. So I can add port 80 there. It should still work. You'll notice that it removes it, um, but those are the, the main differences. So one is HTTPS in the URL, one has HTTP in the URL, one has port 443 as the default, the other one has port 80 by default. We'll talk about ports in a second. Um, these are the defaults. You can use other ports, but typically if you don't specify a port, this is the port that your browser is going to try to use. Um, the other thing to note about HTTP is that it is not encrypted and is vulnerable to man in the middle and eavesdropping attacks. So this is pretty much why we don't really use just HTTP anymore. We use this secure layer on top of it. Um, but it's good to know about the protocol itself, and we're gonna talk about requests and responses and how those work. Those work the exact same way in HTTPS, it's just that they're encrypted. And we don't really have to worry about the specifics of encryption, um, because we're gonna talk about the underlying way of how it works. Cool. Um, I need to like blow my nose or something, so <laughs> give me a second. <laughs> Hello, Cyber3x. Hello, Ed, welcome. Yeah, so for a website to use HTTPS, it has to request a, request a certificate. That is very true. Yep, um, but the modern web doesn't work on peer-to-peer. -peer. There are protocols, and there are people are trying to make it more popular, but if you want to get a job in web de development today, you're probably not going to be doing things peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, thanks for the follow. Uh, wee -woo, ow, ow, <laughs> and thanks for the follow, uh, Captain Claire Bear. Um... I live in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, you can use Let's Encrypt to encrypt your own website for free. That's cool. I think I'll, I'll, that's one thing that I'll mention. Thank you, Koga Master. Um, cool. So where was I? I was here. So HTTP is vulnerable. Uh, typically, when you deploy a website, you're going to want to put HTTPS on it. Um, you can use a service like Let's Encrypt, which was suggested by uh, Koga Master, which will give you free SSL certificates. Um, there was a mention from... Uh, deep sense that uh, if you want a website to use HTTPS, it has to request a certificate from a certificate authority. That's a whole rabbit hole we could go down, but just know that this service Let's Encrypt uh, works with um, 
or it is a certificate authority that will give you free SSL certificates to make your site HTTPS. That's beyond the scope of this lesson, uh, but just let it be known that HTTP is vulnerable. You should probably use HTTPS, but these next few objectives that we're going to talk about um, apply to both HTTP and HTTPS. All right, our next objective is to define and describe the three parts of an HTTP request. Um, so the first part of an HTTP request uh, is the method, or, or sorry, the I'll say I'll call it the request line. The request line itself has multiple parts to it. So the request line has the method, um, the path to the server. So I'll say like uh, host and path, and I believe we should probably just look this up. <laughs> uh, we can look at the network tab here to see. Um, what gets in here. So yeah, that's not going to have it actually. Parts of an HTTP request. All right. Uh, no offense, but let's stop talking about peer to peer in the chat. Um, feel free to take it offline. You can talk on discord. You can do it in DMS, but right now we're talking about HTTP. Um, let's see. Um, don't like that one. Yeah, so we have method, uh, host and path, and then does it include the version in the request line? Um, oh, wow, this is a great article from MDN. <laughs> um, so that has like a cool little diagram. Basic aspects of HTTP. HTTP flow, here we go. Okay, this is what we want to see. So a an HTTP request, the request line has the method, it has the path and the HTTP version. Uh, the next uh, set of things it has are headers. And then, um, if it's not a Git request, it can have a body. So we'll, 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 f we'll step, step back. We're going to redo this one <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about it again. Uh, let me take a drink of water and then we'll get into it. Yeah, there are actually a few, um, top level domains that require that you have HTTPS. They won't work on anything else. So .dev is one of them. I think .app might be one of them. Um, Doc is saying, it's worth pointing out that there's also more to HTTPS than just being off or on. And if you're going to be developing an e-commerce app or something, you might need to look into it. Um, yes. Not a green bottle, a blue bottle. <laughs> I have a blue screen, not a green screen. Hello, Valentine. Deep search since learned about conditional get. Um, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> but let's keep going, because I've been live for almost two hours and we're just getting started on this lesson. Okay, so for this next next objective, we are going to define and describe the three parts of an HTTP request. Now, the first part of an HTTP request is the request line. Um, and if we take a look at this article on MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network that talks about HTTP, uh, we can see in this example request, we have the method, the path on the server, and the HTTP version. So the request line itself is made up of three things. So this is made up of the method, the path, and the HTTP version. Cool. So that's the first part of an HTTP request is the uh, request line. The next part are the headers. And you can have zero or more headers, um, but headers are essentially key value pairs. You can have zero or more. And they add more information to the request that's occurring. Um, and then the last part of an HTTP request is the body. Um, and this is the contents of the request. Now, when we're making uh, post requests to servers, uh, most of the time, the body of the request is something like JSON data, and that's just a, 
a text representation of, of an object, uh, and that's in the body. Um, we'll talk about for get requests, there is no body because it's just a request. Um, and typically the data for that request might actually happen in the, the URL or the URI as query parameters. But these are the three basic parts of an HTTP request. They have the request line, they have the headers, and they have the body. Now, with these three things, you can make an HTTP request to any HTTP server in the world from your computer, from your phone. Um, basically, every, everything works in this format. So because the request line uh, defines the path on the server, uh, we can request different uh, paths from the server. And um, if that server supports different methods, we can request different methods to that server. So using this protocol with uh, in the request, we have the request line, the headers, and the body. Uh, we can make requests to servers. So those are the three parts of the HTTP request. Um, now let's talk about the HTTP response. So Essentially, in the HTTP protocol or the hypertext transfer protocol, I realize if I say HTTP protocol, that's like saying protocol twice. But in this protocol, um, you have the request. That's the thing that the client sends. Basically, the client will make a request to an HTTP server that says, hey, I'm looking for this particular path using this particular method. And then the server can send a response. So let's talk about the three parts of the, so the response. It's very similar. <laughs> so in the response, we have the response line. And the response line is made up of a few parts. So the first part is the status code. Now, the status code will uh, indicate if this was a successful response from the server, because something could have gone wrong. So in that response, it's going to give you a code. And we'll talk about uh, some common codes in a bit. Um, and I guess before the code, you actually get the HTTP version. So we get the HTTP version, we get the status code, and uh, that's it in the, re in the response line. Um, similar to the request, the response can also have headers. And again, these are key value pairs. You can have zero or more. Um, and when we're, um, this is somewhat related, but if a server wants to set cookies on the client, in the response, it will actually have a set cookie header that includes the cookie value. And then the browser knows what to do that with that to add the, add the cookie. Um, there's a lot of other headers. That's just one example. Uh, and then lastly, we have the body of the response. So this is the contents of the response. Um, and we're going to talk about it in a second. But uh, when your browser loads a web page, it's making an HTTP GET request to that server. And that server is responding with all of the HTML contents of that web page. So um, you say, get this web page, and it's responding, and the body of that response is the actual HTML text. What? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about it. Um, and there are a lot of different methods. We're going to talk about methods. Actually, I'm going to add that as an objective. So list common status codes. Um, before we do that, we're going to list common HTTP methods. Um, but now that we've talked about the three parts of the request, three parts of the response. Let's do a simple diagram to talk about what's happening here. Uh, and before we do that, I'll catch up on the chat because there's a lot going on. <laughs> uh, it's all good, Graylin. I, I, it's just like uh, the all these chats are going to be in the background uh, when I create this edited video. So I just want it to be mostly on topic. <laughs> um, for sure, yeah, and and that and that's kind of like the the purpose the the purpose of this lesson and the target audience are people that probably know nothing about protocols in general. So um, to to immediately jump into peer to peer could be like information overload. Um, we got we got to start somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the vod is going to be available. It's on YouTube and it's on Twitch, and I do plan to cut this out. So this this HTTP lesson is going to be its own separate video that you can watch. Uh, yeah, let's catch up. Let's catch up on follows. And there is a Patreon pledge. Um, where are we? Here? No, not there. Here. But uh, wait, the name went away. <laughs> Thank you, whoever you were. I don't, I don't. Maybe I have it. Did it show up here? No, it didn't. <laughs> Talasa, thank you for the Patreon pledge. <laughs> uh. Much, much appreciated. All right, let's let's talk about all the follows. Thanks for the follow, Ashish. Uh, thanks for the follow, MD Box. Thanks for the follow, Ah. Uh, thanks for the follow, Captain Claire Bear. Thanks for the follow, Glue's Cap. 
Thanks for the follow, uh, Wudishenzig. Welcome. <laughs> thanks for the follow, Lemons Galore. And thanks for the follow, Let's Have Kids. Um, there's a lot of chats. I'm just going to scroll a little bit. Yeah, we're going to go to about here and see if there's anything else I should mention. Hello, I am. Welcome to the stream. Uh, Deep Sense says, uh, CDN caches a file. To update the file, it has to do a get. It's conditional because the object might not have changes since the last get request. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, uh, Palsar. Welcome. The protocol allows for content negotiation. That's also true, but I think it's beyond the scope of this lesson. But, but essentially, content negotiation is um, the server can decide the type of data that it sends back. So in, in the request, you can actually uh, send an accept header that says, I want to get back JSON, or I want to get back HTML, or I want to get back an image. And the server can look at that header and say, oh, you want an image? Here you go. So yeah. The web is pure magic. I mean, we can define it. <laughs> um, Terrazoid is saying HTTP 1.1 requires uh, the host header. Um, I guess I guess that would be good to know because I did say zero or more. I want to be mostly technically correct. <laughs> I want to be technically correct. I'll say that. Client must include a host header in all HTTP 1.1 request messages. If the requested URI does not include an internet host name for the service being requested, then the host header field must be given an empty value. That's great to point out. Let's make a quick edit to this video. <laughs> um, so in uh, my descriptions here, I did say headers uh, can have zero or more, but uh, Terrazoid is pointing out if we're using version 1.1 of HTTP, you must have the host header. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to have one or more because um, and actually, the response, I think, can still have zero. But the request must at least have the host header. And we can see here in the protocol description, um, a client must include a host header field in all HTTP 1.1 request messages. Cool. Um, this also might be a good time to mention that um, there are newer versions of HTTP. We're going to be talking about HTTP 1.1, which is pretty prevalent. Um, but there is HTTP 2. It introduces some new things. But for the most part, we're going to talk about the basics of HTTP 1.1. Yeah, so the, it's like the host header combined with the path to know what how to get to that server. Uh, what's my word per minute? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Following for the stash. Thank you, Let's Have Kids. <laughs> um, yeah, must have one, can have more. We'll do that. Yeah, and I guess the, were there a few more follows? Yep, thanks for the follow, Creo. Welcome to the stream. Um, Graylin is saying, protocols are fun to learn about. I do remember the days of HTTP-only websites and CA certificates you had to pay like 300 bucks for. <laughs> so much awesome exists for new and still learning devs. Absolutely, yeah. So we mentioned that a little bit ago. You can get a free SSL certificate uh, from Let's Encrypt. It hasn't always been that way. You used to have to pay a lot of money and jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that your site had HTTPS, which is, which is not cool. It's not great because most sites should be HTTPS. Like, you don't want man-in-the-middle attacks um, you don't want your data to be exposed to anyone else that's on your network. You, you want your data to be secure. So HTTPS is a good thing. All right. Uh, we're going to diagram a request. I think for that we could use, um, there's like, uh, web network diagrams. There's some pretty cool tools out there, but for simplicity, Web sequence diagram, sorry. And I think it's literally like web sequence diagrams.com. Yeah. Um, these are pretty sweet because there's like a, a syntax for defining um, who is the thing doing the request and who's the, the thing getting the response. But for visual sake, I think I'm going to draw it from scratch using like draw.io. But just know that this is a thing. I think I'll mention that really quick. Okay. Where are we? We're here. All right. So we've talked about the parts of the request, the parts of the response. We've talked about what HTTP is. But the next thing we're going to do is diagram an HTTP request response cycle. So we're going to see maybe a little bit better, better and visually how this actually works. Um, and uh, you can go to websequencediagrams.com. And this is actually a neat little tool for creating these types of diagrams. I'm actually just going to create them with boxes and lines uh, to 
better talk about them without having to know like the syntax of this, but just know web sequence diagrams is really great for creating diagrams um, that you can share with others and things like that. But I'm just going to use draw.io, which is uh, just gonna, we're just gonna use some basic uh, squares and lines to talk about this kind of stuff. So um, let's first draw uh, a horizontal, or sorry, a vertical line. Oh, not like that. I don't want a square, I want a rectangle. So I can do that, yeah, okay, so. Um, we're going to have this big vertical line right here, and this is going to represent the, uh, let's call it the browser. So uh, typically you would call this the client. So in in the HTTP world, in the, in, uh, the HTTP protocol, there's this idea of a client and a server. A client is the thing making the requests, and a server is the thing that will respond to that request. So we do have the client here. Um, let's bump up the font size. Big, 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 big. Yeah, we'll just call it the client. But um, like I mentioned earlier, um, in our case, the client is actually your web browser, your, your Chrome, your Firefox, <laughs> your Safari. Um, so we have the client. And then similarly, we have the server. And that's going to be over here, um, uh, waiting for a request. <laughs> All right, so um, the first thing that will happen is the client will make a request. Now we can see that um, if we define the three parts of a request, the request has a request line, headers, and a body. So for simplicity's sake, let's say we are making a request for example.com, okay? So what will happen is the client will initiate a request. So we're gonna have a nice little arrow that goes from the client to the server. Uh, let's bump up the the thickness. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> um, and in this request, we need the request line. So we're going to have that here. Let's also bump up this text. Cool. So the first part of the HTTP request is the request line, and the first part of the request line is the method. In this case, we're going to make a get request. Now, the second part of the request is the path. So where on the server are we requesting it? In this case, we're requesting slash. So we're, we're, we are requesting uh, the root of that web server. Um, and then lastly, what is the HTTP version? We're gonna use HTTP 1.1. It's a little bit bigger, here we go. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's that's the request line. Uh, now we did mention with HTTP 1.1, you must specify the host header. Um, so uh, we also need to specify a series of keys and values, which are the headers that go along with the response. So the first thing is the request line. The next thing are the headers, and these are key value pairs. So they have a key. In this case, the key is host, and they have a value. In this case, um, this is going to be, um, I believe the the uh, this could be like example.com. So we are requesting, um, making a request to example.com on the root path. Um, and there could be other headers here. Um, you could technically specify like the accept header and you could say, I want uh, text HTML. So this is a header that the server can look at and say, um, what kind of data do you want back from me? And we'll, and, uh, you're going to, you're saying, I want text HTML. Um, but there can be many headers. And then lastly, there is a body. Uh, with a get request, there is no body. So if we look at this right here, I want to go to example.com. When I type in my browser, http colon slash slash example.com and hit enter, that makes a get request to the server at example.com um, and request the page at the root path. So that's that's the initial thing that happens. Um, we can see here that it almost happens immediately. I'm on a very fast internet connection. So when I make this request, we just get it back immediately, but it actually does have to hit the server at example.com and get back the response. So let's talk about that. So, and actually, um, this is a little bit off topic, but I can actually simulate that I have a very slow uh, network connection. Let's simulate that and let's watch, watch what happens. Um, so if I make the request, you'll see that it's spinning. It's trying to contact example.com. Example.com needs to read in our request and do something. And then example.com sends back this response. Now let's talk about the response. So uh, the client made the request. It was a get request on slash using the HTTP 1.1 protocol. It specified the host header, and now the server needs to respond. 
Um, now, this server, we don't really know anything about. That server could be running PHP, it could be running Apache, it could be running Node.js, um, it could be literally anything. We don't have to know that. We just have to know that that server is going to respond to an HTTP request. So, um, the server receives that HTTP re uh, request and is now going to respond with the HTML document. So, um, let's just copy this arrow. And we're going to go in the opposite direction, <laughs> uh, like that. Um, and it's important to note that some stuff is going to happen here, right? Uh, if this is a like a static file server, when it receives this request, it's going to um, it basically say, oh, you're requesting the root document? Well, by default, I'm going to give you back the index.html file. So um, the server might actually read that file from disk, index.html, or if that request has already been made, it might read it from cache. Basically, what I'm trying to say is some stuff happens here that we don't exactly know. <laughs> Uh, server uh, thinks about it for a while, <laughs> thinks about it. And eventually responds. <laughs> um, now we could make some assumptions about what's, what's happening here, but honestly, we don't need to know, right? It's it, The server is going to do something. What we care about is that response. Um, now, so if we go back to the three parts of the HTTP response, the first thing is the response line. So in this particular scenario, we're going to say that this is a successful response. Um, so we need a response line on the response that comes back from the server. And in here, we're going to say that uh, initially, uh, it was HTTP 1.1, so the server is responding using the same protocol that it was requested against. Um, and then we have the uh, the status code. And in this case, we're going to say it was successful, so we're going to specify a 200 status code. Um, and um, in a second, we're going to talk about the different types of status codes, but just know that 200 stands for successful. This was a successful uh, request and I am giving you back a response. So uh, the server is responding and it is saying it's successful. Um, now it's going to respond with some headers. Now um, we don't know exactly what it will respond with unless we actually inspect the response. Now I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but here in the Chrome uh, network uh, tools, um, in the dev tools, we can actually see these HTTP requests and response hap responses happening. So if you right click a web page and click inspect, that's going to bring up the Chrome dev tools. Uh, by default, you have this element inspector, but if you click on network, you can actually see all of the network requests that happen on this web page. So if I click refresh, we should see that request right there. Cool. So if I click on it, um, I can actually see the contents of the response. Uh, and we can see that the response actually has a bunch of headers. Response has accept ranges, uh, content length, content type, um, a server, which is ECS. I don't know what that is, but that might be a type of server. But all of these are the response headers. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to write out all of these headers. But just know that these are the headers that it responded with. I think the one that I will respond with is content type, um, because, or at least that I'll show, I'll show in this diagram, um, because uh, we asked for text HTML in the request, and we're going to say the response has a header that says um, content type is text HTML. So the server is is letting us know that it did actually respond with text HTML. So uh, we'll, we'll know how to interpret that. And, and let it be known there are a lot of other headers. And also, um, there are there is a body, right? The body of this response is the actual HTML. So we'll keep inspecting. Um, there is a note from Doc, and you'll notice that uh, this actually came with a 304 status code. Um, so 304 is still a success, but what happened is my browser actually cached the data. So if I disable the cache and we re-refresh this, we should get a 200 status code. There we go. Uh, and we can see that this one has a 200 because it's not reading from the cache. It's directly making that request to the server. Um, cool. So there's a lot of headers. We can see that my browser actually sent a lot of different accept headers or uh, uh, headers overall. So the accept header was more than just text HTML. It says, um, 
Because initially the browser doesn't know. It's like, what is this thing going to respond with? But what they're saying is you can respond with HTML. You can respond with XHTML or XML. You can respond with images. Um, or this star means literally respond with anything. So my browser is saying, hey, whatever you got, give it to me. Um, there's a few other headers in here. Uh, and host, like I said, is example.com because we're making that request to example.com. Cool. So um, those are the requests, those are responses, but the body, that's the thing that we're missing, right? Because in the three parts of the HD response, you have the response line, the headers, and the body. And this is where it all comes together because if we look at the response body, we can see that it's just a bunch of text HTML, right? Because I requested this web page and it's actually giving me back HTML. So uh, what we can show is in the body of this request um, is literally the actual HTML of the web page. So I'm not going to write it all out, but we have like HTML, and then we have the closing HTML, and then we probably have like the um, the head. Um, I want this to be like that, and then we probably have like the body, um, and we have. A bunch of stuff in here. I'm obviously not going to write it all out, but um, just know that the body of this response is the actual HTML page, right? So that's there. Cool. Um, then the uh, this isn't part of the HTTP request and response, but just let it be known that the browser um, or like client can now do something with. Uh, with the HTML text. What that is, I don't know. <laughs> if this is a web browser, it's probably going to uh, take that HTML text and parse it and turn it into the DOM. We'll talk about the DOM in the future, but basically that's what a web browser is going to do with that response. Um, but for the most part, this is uh, a very simple example of an HTTP request and an HTTP response. The entire World Wide Web is built up of, uh, off of this. Um, you make HTTP requests every single day, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not. If you have a mobile phone, you're making HTTP requests. If you have a browser, you're making HTTP requests. This is the basis of, of all of the World Wide Web. Um, let's see if there was anything else interesting in here. Um, yeah, you can see that um, the browser figured out what the remote address was. Now, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but DNS, is a topic for a, another video, but we can see that uh, example.com got resolved to 93.184.216.34 and to port 80. Um, I believe we have an objective to talk about um, common ports. Where is that? Yeah, common ports. <laughs> that's the next one. Um, but HTTP, the default port is port 80, and so that's what it used. Cool. All right, I'm going to catch up on the chat, and then we'll keep on talking. <laughs> um doo -doo -doo -doo. I need to <laughs> I need to take a sip of water. <clears throat> yep, chance we're talking about HTTP. Yeah, even HTTPS has multiple different versions. Yeah. Uh, the client can be a server itself, like your backend making a Twitter API request. Yeah, that's that's um, that's great to point out. I, it's maybe uh, a two, like a little bit in the weeds because we could go on forever with that. But uh, literally a, a client, and let's, uh, I'll say that really quick. So there's a nice comment from Doc who says, uh, the, con the client can be a server itself, like a backend making a Twitter API request. Yeah, so it's not limited that in this, um, in this flow and in this protocol, the client is a web browser. The client can literally be anything. And often servers are clients themselves. So your browser might make a request to a server, but in turn, that server might go off and make a request to some other server. Um, so uh, th there's a lot of complexity here, but the, the underlying protocol and this idea of client server, it, it um, that doesn't change even if your server eventually becomes the client for another server. It, it goes way down. It's it's HTTP all the way down. <laughs> uh, good night, Crazy Gamer. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the follow, Flipper. Thanks for the follow. Take a chance. Uh, Deepsense says, I wrote so much Java client server code, I can do it in my sleep. 
What's up, Josh? Yeah, we're talking about HTTP. Um, yeah. Latency, all that good stuff. Uh, that's a great question, Conrad. Yeah, so we talked about, and our next, next objective is to list common ports associated with HTTP and HTTPS, but by default, if you don't specify a port and you make a, a GET request in the browser to H an HTTP URL, it's going to default, It's by default, it's going to try port 80. Um, uh, when we're doing local development, we use things like port 3000 because port 80 is actually a privileged port. And typically, you would have to run your server um, using super user privileges to run it on port 80. So that's why in development, we use things like 3000. But HTTP can run on any port. It doesn't just have to be eight, port 80. HTTPS doesn't just have to be port 443, which is the default. It can run on any port, but those are the defaults and those are, those are the convention. Yeah. Thanks for the follow and McBusiness. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> Uh, yeah, port 3000 is generally a non-public port for development. Um, it is an HTTP port, but generally we use a proxy to redirect that, for sure. <laughs> uh, how do I stream on both at the same time? I'm using uh, an open source um, Docker container and web app called MultiStreamer. Yeah, so MultiStreamer is an app uh, that um, basically allows you to forward your outgoing stream to multiple services. And then I am actually running uh, a Docker container, Docker multi-streamer, um, that uh, is running on my streaming machine that I then send the stream from OBS to it, and then I've configured it to broadcast to both YouTube and Twitch. But Docker, Docker multi-streamer is the thing that I use. I'll send this. <laughs> Docker. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and thanks for the suggestion earlier, Doc. Um, yeah, and because that's another thing to note. If we disable, if we disable the cache now, we're gonna get it probably a three hundred four because uh, that means uh, content not modified. Just serve what you have from the cache. Yeah. And thanks for the follow, Italian football. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> uh, Vweb code just bought a vertical mouse. Yeah, I'm, I'm using a, a vertical left-handed mouse. Um, HTTP requests default to port 80, HTTPS defaults to port 443, yeah. Packet sniffing is dangerous. Um, I do, like, for some jobs that I had at work on our recent contract, I had to do packet sniffing because I was dealing with not the HTTP protocol, I was dealing with a radius protocol, and I needed to look at the packets to see what was actually happening, yeah. Uh, you can run it on port 80. You would just need to do like sudo uh, or su like have you super user privileges or on a, on a Windows machine, run your terminal with administrator privileges. But yeah. <laughs> and um, running an app on port 443 doesn't mean by default you get HTTPS. You still have to configure a, a, a certificate on the server. Um, technically, you could run an HTTP site on port 443 if you really wanted to. Um, though I don't know, no one does that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the HTML body doesn't have to be text. It could be binary data, but that binary data is put into a text format with like Unicode characters, even though it's binary, um, it's still text. It's all, it's text all the way down. Thanks for the follow, uh, Cosmic. <laughs> the rise of the semantic web is coming. Yeah. For sure. Hello, Amada. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Docker also has a client and server. Yeah, but I, I believe it probably communicates over like a different protocol. Uh, is latency good on that setup since it's on the same machine? Um, I am apps. I'm using double the, the upload bandwidth. That's one thing to note. Yeah, so my my one machine and my one internet connection is streaming to both YouTube and Twitch. Um, that said, I have a pretty fast internet connection and it seems to be working okay. I've been doing it for a couple of months now. So yeah. Uh, dark mode on GitHub. I am um, I'm using uh, this extension called uh, Stylus, I think. Stylus, yeah. So this is the open source one that doesn't track you. There was another one, an older one called Stylish, 
don't use that one. Uh, they literally track every single website you go to. Um, but Stylus is an extension you can install. And then if you go to userstyles.org, you can search for styles of all kinds of things. Search for GitHub. You'll find uh, GitHub Dark. Um, their search engine is so horrible. Um, GitHub Dark. Come on, GitHub Dark 2.0? Is that the one that I use? I don't think so. Yeah, their, their search engine is not good. Uh, but I use one that's called GitHub Dark. Um, and we can actually see that it has an update. So I can install the update. Um, I have the Express Docs Dark. I think that was actually made by Alka. Uh, Google Translate Dark. <laughs> uh, and these themes are just a custom CSS style sheet um, that gets applied automatically whenever you're on github.com. Yeah. Uh, I have a basement. I stream from my basement at home. <laughs> uh, the Radius protocol. It's a protocol used for authentication um, in um, like network, network devices. Um, so authenticating a particular MAC address on a particular client device with the networking switch um, or like the, the gateway switch that um, it's probably a, it's a horrible way of talking about it, but it, it's that. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Free Radius, uh, this is an open source Radius server that you can run and manage uh, authentication of devices on your network. Um, so yeah, I was doing stuff like that. Oh, okay. So I guess it could literally be binary, binary data. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the follow, Shakodes. Thanks for the follow, uh, Kapura Paka. Welcome. Uh, what's the delay to OBS? I don't know if I can see that. But... Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Actually, I, here's what I can do. I can go, I can go directly to twitch.com and we can see um, how many seconds delay I am. I think that's what you're asking, right? All right, I'm gonna be really quiet. All right, I'm gonna be really quiet. Hello, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, Hello. five, five. Mississippi. <laughs> so roughly five sec five seconds of delay from uh, what's happening on <laughs> uh, live on Twitch, and then the, the delay is a little bit longer on YouTube. That's just how their servers work. Um. Uh, that's a good point, Avi. I, I, I mean, I still th I, actually I think it's I think it's beyond the scope of this lesson. But yeah, it is something to take into account. Uh, these days, if you have a site running on HTTPS, all of your resources, your scripts, your images need to be running on HTTPS as well, or it will break the website. Yeah, help. <laughs> uh, if you do uh, commands, yeah, you'll get them. Ah, yeah, so that's a good point. So like when you're streaming a video, it only asks for like chunks of it at a time. It's good, it's good, to, good to know. Let's hydrate. <laughs> I am not a network engineer. Uh, you could call me a full stack engineer because I build applications that run on networks, but no, there's a lot. There's so much that I don't know about uh, networking and like you can get like Cisco certifications and stuff like that. That, that, is, that is, I'm way out of my element when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, thanks for the YouTube sub, uh, Nisha. Everyone, yeah, and that's the thing. If you're a web developer, you're some kind of network engineer. Like you may not know all like the super low level stuff, but you have to understand parts of it uh, to be a good web developer and a good debugger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Abdelhamid says they solved the hardest and failed on the easiest. That's unfortunate. Oh, I can view the, the, the delay on Twitch. I didn't know that. Yep. Hello, take a chance. That's pretty much what I do too. Just write stuff. It shows up. <laughs> um, being a network magician and 99% of engineering is magic. Uh, do I know anything about Red Hat certifications? Nope, I don't have any certifications. Uh, <laughs> I, I like they can be useful when you're looking for a job, especially a job of a particular type, because you can say, "Hey, I have this certification. I kind of know what I'm doing." Um, but 
building web applications, I don't, I mean, you can get like a web developer certificate from somewhere. I don't know. I don't have any certs. I don't really know much about them. <laughs> That's a good point, Deep Sense. What's the delay for you? Um, transatlantic cable. So five seconds is an understatement. Yeah, because you're, it's going, it's going across the ocean. Okay. Um, where were we? All right, we diagrammed a simple HTTP request and response. All right, here's what we're going to do. Um, this is an exercise for you, the viewer. Now, do, I'm going to ask some questions. Do not immediately say the answer in the chat, okay? Because you'll spoil it for everyone else. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask a question, and then when I say go, that's when you can respond with your answer to the question. Does everyone understand? Let's get a, a nodding yes in the chat if you understand. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Here we go. Very good. Okay. So here is our first question. Um, and actually, let me, let me change this to be... Um, no fill. Have your points. We'll do red. Yeah, a little bit of opacity will be good. All right, very good. Everyone understands. <laughs> awesome. Okay, here is your first question. What is in the red box here? What am I surrounding? What is this thing? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds and then when I say go, Tell me the answer. So what is this, this whole thing right here? Uh, as a whole, what is it? Oh yeah, you can go and <laughs> you can give me the answer, but uh, no, it's fine. It's fine, Ashish. So this is an HTTP request, right? It's okay, it's okay. For the next one, everyone knows what to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> chaos theory, shaking my head. But yes, this is the HTTP request. It's the, it's the request that's going from the client to the server. All right, no worries. All right, I have another question for you. <laughs> um, here's what I'm gonna do. I think we'll number it. I do like, yeah, let's go bigger. <laughs> you blew it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. Hey, you're right, Critical, it is actually just text. <laughs> um, it is an HTTP request. Okay. If you remember, back to our objectives, there are three parts of an HTTP request. I am going to move this to, wait, wait, wait. We're going to move this right here. Uh, again, don't answer in the chat. I could just hide the chat manager. That's true. Let's do that. <laughs> so you have 10 seconds. Um, what is this first part of the HTTP request? What is it known as? Mm hmm see lots of people raising their hands all right <laughs> let's uh let's choose someone you can answer now answer in the chat <laughs> here we go the request line yeah so uh i meant the entire thing so those of you that said method you're absolutely right uh, 20 to 25 milliseconds. That's wow. Um, so, uh, in, in the three parts of the HTTP request, this first part here, this whole part right here is known as the request line. Now, some of you mentioned it, uh, the request line is actually made up of three different parts. So the first thing is the method. We then have the path and then we have the protocol. All right. So that's the first part. All right. So your next question is what is this? This is the second part of an HTTP request. What are these known as here? Maybe I should be drawing boxes because <laughs> um, it could be a little confusing as to what I'm actually talking about, but I'm talking about this, this second part here, the, the host and accept, what are those things? I'll give you five seconds. Put your answer in the chat now. What are these things? This is the second part of an HTTP request. They are the headers. Yeah, good job, Dirk Earl and Katoli. 
and a sheesh. So these are key value pairs um, that the server can use to determine what they're actually going to send you uh, to the response. An arrow to the right. Yeah, you're right, Joe. <laughs> Got some sarcastic people today. Cool. So uh, those are the headers. And there is a third part of the HTTP request. Now, because this is a because this is a get request, it doesn't actually show up in this type of request. But uh, in the chat, you can go ahead and tell me now, what is that third part of an HTTP request? We did mention it. <laughs> Here we go. The body, the buddy. <laughs> it's the body, yeah. So um, typically when you're doing like a post request, the body of the request is gonna be like a JSON object, um, or it could really just, it could be anything, but the body is the actual data that you're sending to the server. But like we said, in a get request, there is no body. Very good. So. Um, this first thing, that's the HD request. That happens. The server receives it. It thinks about it. it. It does the stuff that it needs to do. We don't really care about the implementation details. But at the end of the day, um, it is going to do something. So my question to you, and yeah, I know the chat is a little bit behind, but um, here's your next question. Um, what is this? Big old thing here. <laughs> what is that? You can go ahead and say it in the chat now, but what is this thing? That thing. It is the response, yes. So this is the HTTP response. Very good, everyone. <laughs> um, and this is the thing that the server responds with uh, in response to our request that the server received. Very good. All right. Uh, the response is made up of three parts. Um, what is the first part of the uh, HTTP response? Now, we're talking about um, all three things here, or all, um, all two things here, sorry. <laughs> um, but what is that thing known as? And then what are the two things that are on this thing? But first, what's the name of this thing? And what are those two things? <laughs> um, you can go ahead and start answering in the chat now. Um, and let's see if we can, um... oh, I don't wanna do that. I kind of want to like describe what they are. Okay, what do we got in the chat? No cheating. <laughs> um, the protocol and status code. Uh, yes, they are. So um, those. So the first thing HTTP 1.1 describes um, the the version, the HTTP version that it's responding with, and then 200 is the status code. But what is that one thing known as? Like those two things together, the response line. There we go, Ashish. So um, the the response itself. Yeah, there we go. De Deep Sense has it. Response line, status code, and version. So the response line um, describes the the protocol and version, and describes the status code. Um, now there's another part and this one should be pretty easy because it's very similar to the, um, the HTTP request. What is, um, this, this piece here, there's, there's multiple of them. <laughs> Hello, David. Welcome to the stream. Um, I, I need to just, can I just move? There we go. <laughs> so what are these? Yeah, these are headers. So these are response headers. And the server can set any number of these. Uh, we saw the example in the browser where it actually sets quite a few response headers, um, like content length. That's actually like how much data it's sending. Um, cache control tells how often the browser should check for new versions or just serve from the cache. Um, and so yeah, these are the response headers. So these are headers in the response. Very good. And then our last piece, which actually didn't show up in the get request, um, is this thing here, we'll call it number three. This is the third part of an HTTP response. What is it? What is it? Time to hydrate. <laughs> it is the body, the body, le corpse. <laughs> is that French? The body, 
Yep, and Maddow has it. So in this particular case, the server, remember we talked about the server's got to do something, but in this case, uh, the server uh, responded with HTML text. That body could be anything. Uh, Doc was mentioning earlier that it could actually be binary data. Um, it, it could be... It could be anything, <laughs> um, but in this case, it is known as the response body. It's it's basically what the server is giving you in response. Um, now we can go deeper and we can say, uh, because we're using a browser, it actually takes that HTML, parses it into the DOM, and then gives us this, which is nice and beautiful, and we can see it, and we can in interact with it as humans. Um, but ultimately, it's just responding with this text, right? It gives us this text and then it's up to the browser to turn it into something that we can see and use. But the server, all it did was give us this HTML text. Very good. Uh, Valencian, what did you try, Katoli? El course. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, so when you, when you watch a live stream, uh, you're probably, um, and that's actually why there is a delay because it uses HLS uh, streaming, which um, is big, giving you like a, a chunk of video one at a time, um, but it's a little bit behind so that it can take the next chunk, show that to you, and then it just seems like one continuous flow, but you're actually like five seconds behind the actual live thing. So yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, the I'll, I'll let you know, David, the first hour and a half is just us talking. <laughs> so yeah. And all of those chunks are HTTP requests. There we go. It all comes together. Cool. So um, you all did wonderful. Full marks, five stars for everyone. <laughs> Let's look up our next thing. Okay. So I'm going to cover this objective. We'll talk about methods. We'll talk about status codes. And then I'm going to go eat some lunch because it's 12.15. Uh, it's okay. Uh, for this next objective, we are going to list common ports associated with HTTP and HTTPS. Um, and those of you in the chat, if you had questions about like, why do we use port thousand feel, or different things like that? Feel free to ask those now and, and we'll answer them now that we're talking about um, ports. So for HTTP, the common and default port is port 80. So whenever you make a request to a website, in this case, example.com, we're using HTTP. Um, the browser automatically actually defaults to port 80 because we didn't specify a port. Technically, we could put a port on there. We might not get anything in response because there's probably nothing listening on port 3000 on this server. Uh, but by default, if we leave that port off, the browser will automatically default to port 80. Uh, and we can actually see that um, in the, uh, the dev tools here, we can see that uh, it defaults to port 80 right there. Cool. So HTTP defaults to port 80. HTTPS defaults to port 443. So again, um, it's not very user friendly and we typically don't have to put in port 443 for every single website we visit. But if we go to HTTPS colon slash slash google.com, by default, the browser sees that this is HTTPS and it's going to put port 443 on there by default. But technically I could put 443. It's still going to work. Their server has some stuff that's going to redirect me, or it might even be my browser that removes colon 443 because it's it's default anyways. Um, but that's the default HTTPS ports. Um, now, servers can listen on any number of ports, and you actually can have an HTTP server that's running on port 3000, or port 3001, or port 8080, or port 1337, um, and even an HTTPS uh, server that's running on any, any of these ports. Uh, these are just the default ports that by default, if you don't specify a port, that's what your browser is going to default to when it's making requests to those servers. Um, but like I mentioned, um, if, if you're building an express application or like a backend application, typically we use port 3000 really just for development, but that is actually an HTTP server running on port 3000. Uh, we technically could start it on, on port 80 if we wanted to. Cool. Um, so those are the default ports. Um, in another lesson, we'll actually talk about like what are the parts of the URL which include the port, but for now, just know that those are the default ports. All right. <laughs> uh, for this next objective, we are going to list common HTTP methods. Now, we saw in our very basic example, the HTTP method get. Um, this is the most basic one. Like we mentioned, it doesn't have a body. It's just saying, please give me this resource. And those are the kind of requests we make whenever we're visiting websites. So when I go to google.com and I hit enter, that's a git request for that web page. Um, Ashish has some other common um, methods mentioned. So we have put, 
post, delete. Ultrendo is saying patch. What are some other methods? Just throw some HTTP methods at me. <laughs> so we have uh, put, post. Post is probably, get and post are going to be some of the most common and popular uh, requests you see. Head is another good one. This is a request that will only respond with uh, the headers. Um, let's see, get put post, there's a delete. What else? <laughs> Uh, Greenland says, I develop software almost every day and I'm still learning stuff here. That's good to know. Um, patch. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention patch. Uh, and Doc is saying head is, is good to note. Um, and so it, it, there, there are some intricacies of this. But yes, um, you can see in my browser, whenever I got the... Um, the 304 response instead of the 200 response. Um, this actually ended up using a head request to know that it didn't have to do the underlying request. It's cool. Um, conditional get, is that a thing? <laughs> I never heard of that. I think that's the thing that you mentioned earlier. Uh, we have patch. Uh, is connect one? I've never even heard of connect. Um, so today, Harja, we're just talking about the the network tab in Chrome. So specifically just this tab. <laughs> and there's a whole lot we can learn about just this tab. Um, a future video, we'll talk about the console and the element selector, but today, just the network tab. Trace, op options are a good one. Yeah, options are another very, very common one. Um, typically an options request is used to determine if a server supports cores or cross-origin resource sharing. Um, is trace one? I don't think I've heard of that one. <laughs> Uh, is uh, update one? I don't know. Okay, so uh, let's actually just let's search for a list of um, HTTP methods. We should be able to find a list on the web. HTTP request methods on the Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, get, head, post, put, delete, connect, um, options, trace, and patch. I think we got all of those. Conditional get was an extra one. I'm going to take it. I think it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> I'm going to take it off for now. Um, but those are a bunch of different methods. Um, there are, I believe there are more. Uh, if we can find it, let's find it on Wikipedia. So if we go to the hypertext transfer protocol um, document on Wikipedia and we look up the methods, request methods, um, we see git, head, post, put, delete, trace, options, connect, and patch. So I guess that's most of them. Um, and we're not going to get into the intricacies of what all of these different things mean. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, all we're doing is we're changing the method that we, we put in the request header. For all intents and purposes, that's really what we're doing. That said, because the server needs to think about the request, it can decide to do different things based on the method that we specify in the request. And usually there will be documentation about that, like how a server uh, responds to a particular type of method. Um, but that said, what in, in what we've talked about here, the main thing that will change is we're actually going to change the header, the, the method that we put in our initial request. Um, so that's great. Uh, we can talk about, and you can see it in that uh, Wikipedia article, that some of these methods are known as uh, safe methods. <laughs> that means that for the most part, they shouldn't actually, they won't actually modify or delete anything. Um, and git is known as uh, usually a safe method because it's just saying get that data. Whereas some of these other methods might indicate um, that we're changing things or we're creating things. Like post is typically used to create a new thing. Um, Put is usually used to like update a thing. Uh, patch is usually used to update a thing, but only update a thing partially. Uh, delete is used to delete a thing. But like I said, all of these are just different types of methods. Ultimately, the server is going to decide to do something different with that request based on the method that you send. Cool. So those are some common methods. Let's talk about status codes. Now, uh, we showed earlier that um, the 200 status code means everything OK. <laughs> um, it means that we made a request. The server was able to satisfy that request and send back a response. And it sends the status code 200. Now, one of the other uh, status codes we saw was 304. And 304 is uh, not modified. Now, 
this gets into the intricacies and how things can get a lot more complex where the initial request to example.com returns a 200 status code, but because that server doesn't want us to send requests all the time, it actually responded with an expires header, which says, um, hey, this content is good for the next seven days. So when you make a request here again, you don't need to make the full request. Uh, you can just serve it from the cache. And if you're serving it from the cache, um, the response is 304 not modified. <laughs> uh, there we go. DeepSense has a very common one that you've probably seen before. Uh, 404 is not found. Uh, and if a server, if we try to make a request to a server and it can't find it, it'll typically respond with a 404. Let's see if we can do that here. If we do like slash not exist. Um, we do get back a 404. So you can see that uh, the server was like, hey, that doesn't exist. I'm giving you a 404 uh, error code. Do that with what you will. At the same time, a 404 can have a response body. And we can see that the response body is exactly the same for a get request. It's just that it's telling us, hey, I couldn't find anything, but you're going to get this default content anyway. <laughs> Ultrinda says, it's nice when you have a hotel room 404. Uh, Katoli has another one, 403 uh, not authorized. Um, so this is a status code that would be used when you're trying to access something that you don't have access to. Uh, and there are a ton. So. Um, here we go. And Katul has the 418 is the teapot. <laughs> um, so let's just look up uh, HTTP status codes. We should be able to find a bunch of them on Wikipedia. Um, HTTP statuses.com is a really good one. But if you go to the Wikipedia article for a list of HTTP status codes, um, first of all, we can see that they're grouped into different categories. So there are 100 level status codes that are typically used for information. Uh, 200 level, that means, uh, or typically means it's a successful response. Uh, 300 level, which are used for redirection. So we saw the 304, because the 304 response was basically saying, uh, there's no need to request this resource again. I'll just redirect you, or you should just use the cache. So that was a 304. Um, 400 level error errors are typically a client error. Then that, that means that in this diagram, um, the client did something wrong. It specified the wrong path, or it doesn't have access to that resource, but the server is going to respond with a 400 level status code. So 404 is not found. That means client, you did something wrong. You tried to request something that's not there. 403, unauthorized. Client, you did something wrong. You requested something that doesn't exist. Um, 401 is also unauthorized. Like client, you did something wrong. You're, you're the problem. So 400 level is typically the client did something wrong. And then 500 level is if the server did something wrong. So uh, typically just a generic 500 status code is just server error or internal server error. Um, but there are other 500 level status codes. Uh, things like 501 not implemented, 502 bad gateway, 503 service unavailable. Um, but these are all related to things that went wrong on the server whereas these 400 status codes are things that the client did wrong. Um, and something that was mentioned earlier is uh, the 418 status code. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most Yeah, Sim John says most important 418 Katul. So uh, this was actually an April Fool's joke from a very, very long time ago. Yeah, 1998. Is that long? That's like 20 years, 10 years ago? 20 years ago. I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but the 418 response is, I'm a teapot. Uh, and basically, this is a client error because this error will happen if you make a request to a teapot uh, using the Hypertext Coffee Pot protocol. So if you make a coffee uh, pot protocol request to a teapot, that teapot is going to respond with a 418 because it is a teapot. And so 418 is, I'm a teapot. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was an April Fool's joke from uh, 1998. It was pretty cool. And then uh, someone mentioned on uh, the Twitter API uh, will respond with 420. Uh, it's not listed here, but 420 um, is almost synonymous with um, uh, 429, which is too many requests. But if you if you if you make too many requests to the uh, Twitter API, it's going to respond with a 420 that says, "Whoa, dude, enhance your call." <laughs> um, yeah. Um. 451 is being used by the GDPR purposes now. So 451 is unavailable for legal reasons. Yeah, very interesting. 
Yeah, we, I, we talked about that in the past. Someone sp- set their license plate to null. <laughs> Internet control message protocol is responsible for generating some of these. Yeah. Hello, Prakash. No need to type on the keyboard a bunch, but welcome to the stream. <laughs> um, cool. So. Um, those are some common HTTP status codes, um, and, and typically these status codes will, will help you figure out what went wrong if something did go wrong. Um, so they're good for debugging. Um, if you go to, and actually, um, let me put this in the resources section, but, uh, if you go to HTTP, uh, statuses.com. This is a nice little rundown of, of all the, the, the major um, HTTP status codes, and you can click on them to, to learn a bit more about them. Cool. I'll list that here as well. <laughs> um, all right. So that's pretty much it for all this stuff. Now it's, it's time to actually um, uh, do an exercise. And, and part of what I did here, and I kind of skipped to it is when we were examining what was happening with the request and the response of this example.com webpage, um, we were using the Chrome dev tools. So, uh, before I move on, let's, let's just take a, a second to break down the different sections of the Chrome dev tools network tab, um, to understand how those fit in with our re- request response diagram. So, if we look in the Chrome DevTools, uh, and here, right now I have it on preserve log. So if I refresh the page, uh, we see all of the previous logs. But if I uncheck this, we're only going to see the one request that was made. So if you have the Chrome DevTools open, when a page is loaded, you're going to see that initial request. So we're going to see, um, and if we click on it, we can see in the headers, we can see that it's requesting this particular web, particular website. We can see the method that was used, in this case, a get. We can see the status code, which is which came back in the response. Um, we can see the remote address, which is the actual IP address of the server we're making the request against. We also see the port. Um, we see the response headers. So in our diagram, those are the things right here, like content type. Those are the things coming back from the server that are headers, key value pairs. And we can see those in the Chrome DevTools here. We see the response headers. Uh, we can also see the request header. So request headers are things that the browser sent or the client sent in the request. Now, um, right now, our client is just the browser. In a future video, we're going to talk about how JavaScript can actually initiate these requests using XML HTTP requests or fetch. And when you're using those things, um, you can actually define your request entirely. So instead of having all of these extra headers added by the browser, you can define what your um, accept header is, and you can define what your body is. But for now, we'll see that. Uh, and so we see the request headers. Um, and because this was a Git request, we actually don't see the body or the params. But if this was any other request that included a body, we would actually see the contents of the body here. Um, and then lastly is the HTTP res- uh, response. So we can again, we can see the response headers, but we can also see the response body. So the actual content of the response and in the Chrome dev tools that is on the response tab. So this actually shows us the full HTML text content that the server responded with. Um, and we can inspect that here. If we click on preview, that's actually going to try and render it. Um, if you're ever making requests for JSON data, not HTML, you'll actually see a nice, uh, JSON navigator in here. Uh, and we can also look at timing to see like how long the request took and all that good stuff. But That said, the Chrome DevTools Network tab is a huge help for debugging what's happening uh, when your page is loading and when you're making requests. So um, get used to it, learn the parts and pieces of it. Like I said, when we start making requests with JavaScript, it's going to really come in handy to be able to know, are we sending the right data from the server? What kind of a response are we getting from a server? Uh, Those kinds of things. All right, so I have an exercise for you. I'm going to create a simple web page. And I want you to diagram what's happening on that simple web page. So let's do this. I'm going to create a folder. Uh, example. We're going to create a new file, index.html. Um, we'll do this. We're going to say example web page. <laughs> rough. Take a chance as rough. What's rough? Lunch. Uh, thanks for the follow, uh, Nassel Eric. <laughs> Hello, BZ. Welcome to the stream. 
Oh, I see. That that's what's rough. <laughs> okay, BZ. <laughs> um That's a good point, Doc. Yeah, so um I'll just say this. So there's a good comment from Doc who says, uh, the dev tools doesn't always correspond one to one with raw HTTP requests. Um if you want to look at raw HTTP requests, you might use a, a packet sniffing tool like Wireshark or something like that. Um, the Chrome Dev DevTools and Network tab is definitely much higher level, but like I said, it's still going to help you debug things. But if you if you really need to get lower level, you should use some other tool that will you'll you'll see every single HTTP request and response, and you'll you'll see the details of it without some extra things sprinkled on top. Hello, Andreas. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to make this basic web page. And this is going to be a little bit tricky because there's one thing I didn't talk about when talking about HTTP requests and responses that's going to happen here. And if you understand HTTP so far, maybe, maybe you can deduce that this is what's going to happen. But okay, let's say we just have an H1 that says this is an example. Um, we're going to add some CSS. Um, I made this style sheet a long time ago. Does it still work? Let's see. Yeah, still works. Cool. <laughs> um, so we added some CSS. We have an H1. Uh, let's add an image. Um, let's just go on uh, Imager and find a nice little image to show. Whoa. Whoa! No way! <laughs> That's crazy. Um, we need we need just like a happy image. Happy. That's a happy dog. <laughs> uh, Oh, there's Bill Nye. Is this like a GIF? Was that a ramp? Is that a skateboard ramp? <laughs> I just need a I just need an image. Pizza kittens. Alright, I'm gonna search for pizza kittens. So cute. Oh, these are all kinds. Very good. Uh, we'll, we'll go with this one. Yeah, that's Jeff. Cool. So uh, we'll say this is an example. <laughs> we have a, a pizza kitten image. Um, we'll have like a break for that. Um, and I think that's about it. Let's see what we get. So. We go into that example page, um, and I just use HTTP server, which is a tool I have installed. Well, I don't have installed globally. Let's install it globally. So HTTP server is a tool you can install from NPM globally to run your own local HTTP server. If you've ever seen me use light server or live server, um, it's doing this. But HTTP server is a little bit different because it does a lot of caching, and it's a better static file server. So I'm going to run HTTP server in this folder. I now have a local HTTP server running on port 8081. And you'll notice because it's running on port 8081, we have to specify it, right? If I just did port 80, I don't think we'll get anything. We might get something weird because this is my machine. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it breaks. <laughs> um, but if I do port 8081, we can, see, we can see this website. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to deploy this website to the internet. Um, and then I want you, I'm going to give you this URL, and I want you to create a diagram of all the requests and responses that are happening for you to load this web page. Um, so here's what we're going to do. I think I'm just going to use now. Um, let's call this HTTP-example. <laughs> it's a static website. Let's deploy it. Here we go. So uh, I have put this website on the internet. It's available at this URL. <laughs> and I'm going to put this in the chat. So you can you can go to it in the chat. Here we go. There we 
There's that. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I might leave that out of the video because, uh, again, I just want people to, um, I, I don't want them to do this. We're going to use, ultimately, this, this website that I created. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. I'm, I'm going to give you, I'll give you, fifth, I'll give you 10 minutes. So basically, I want you to go to this website, and I want you to create a uh, an HTTP request response diagram for everything that happens um, whenever um, you visit this website. So um, I sent you the link. I want you to go there. And you can use a tool like draw.io. Um, you can use websequencediagrams.com. You might have to figure out how to use it. Uh, you could draw it on paper and then take a picture of it. <laughs> um, but anyone that's watching and anyone that's interested, I want you to create a diagram of what's happening when you load this web page. Now, can I just get like an emoji reaction or a raised hand in the chat? Who's gonna try this? Who's gonna try to create a diagram of what's happening when they load this web page? Okay. Take a chance is gonna give it a try. <clears throat> Anyone else? It's okay if you don't, you can just watch. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, and thanks for the follow, uh, Rafael Santos, welcome. Gray Lane is gonna try because they wanna learn how to do diagrams, that's great. So yeah, you can try web sequence, you can try uh, draw.io is another one. Um, and then actually, if you could just go to draw.google.com, they have a drawing tool as well. Um, there's also Lucid Chart, which I've used in the past. All right, Altrindo is going to take a chance. Altrindo. All those tabs. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get rid of them soon. Um, let's get rid of them. And actually, I need to put these in resources. Um, that's a resource. Ah, John Sugar is saying Firefox will let you see raw headers. Um, there's ICANN. We were talking about that earlier. Oh, the Rick and Morty API. We didn't, we didn't even go over that. Uh, hypertext transfer protocol. We linked to that. Link to that. There's the example website. HTTP overview. It's definitely a resource. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and actually, can I share this? Because uh, I would totally be okay if you just um, um, if you if you took this as a basis and used it to describe what's happening um, on the website that I just created, publish a link. Create. Oh wow! Will that actually work? Is it too long? Let's try it. Hey! <laughs> and then if I click edit. All right, let's try it in a private tab. Will that work? Nice. All right, cool. I'm going to share this link too. Um, so if you want to go from the diagram that I've already drawn. Oh, no, it's too long. <laughs> uh, let's make it a short URL. Um, Bitly? All right, will this work? Cool. <laughs> so many levels of indirection. Um, but if you go to this link, um, that is the diagram that I drew, and you can use it as a basis if you want to. OK, but yes, um, basically, what I want you to diagram is what happens when you go in a browser to this URL. and um, the interesting thing and the tricky thing is there's more than just one request, right? Uh, Ashish mentions that there's three requests, but what are those requests? Um, and will you actually write those out in your diagram? 
Actually, I do have a, a URL shortener. <laughs> uh, we made it on a noob quest a while back, but it has to spin up. I could have put it there. Uh, we'll keep that open. This is Q and A. Um, there's that. Okay, I'm gonna set a timer for seven minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll do eight minutes. <laughs> Um, but anyone that wants to uh, give a try at a diagram, try it, somehow link it to me. Um, you can also post an image in the chat. I'm going to give you eight minutes to create your diagram, and then we'll create one. But yeah, this is a URL shortener, shortener I made a long time ago. Thanks for the follow, Ella, Ella Denmark. Yeah, and it's interesting to note, like if you go to this web page, and you open the DevTools, and you click on Network, and you click Refresh, there's more than just one request, right? How weird is that? <laughs> what do we have to do? So basically, go to this URL, uh, http-example.now.sh, and I want you to create a diagram for everything that happens uh, when your browser makes a request to this page. That's what I want you to do. And actually, while you're working on that, uh, if, any, if anybody new comes into the chat, tell them hello. Tell them what we're working on. I'm going to be back. I'm going to take, take a seven and a half minute break. <laughs> And I'll come back, and uh, we'll see what you got. We'll see what you got. Thanks for the follow, Celtic. I'll be back soon. Uh, and you can play the drop game while I'm gone, too. So I've been way too long.
Hello friends! I'm back. Um, something happened. There was a- there we go! Super chat! <laughs> super chat from Brandon! Thank you so much, Brandon, for the $1.99 super chat. Much, much appreciated. Um... Oh. Oh. <laughs> um... Let's see, yeah, so uh, Grayland says, I can't do a diagram in eight minutes, but I will do one. Hey, give it your best shot. Let's see, are there any submissions? Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, Deep Sense. Oh, man. So many unacknowledged messages, but Deep Sense. Uh, shared on Google Drive. All right. Let's go to it. Um, and they tried to embed Imager. That's, that, that's totally fine. Oh, it's an album. I think that's why it didn't work. You need to embed the actual image itself. <laughs> okay. Um, this is not a full <laughs> HTTP request response diagram. So, because um, basically there's going to be actually multiple servers involved um, and just one client. So um, this is very high level. I want to see more detail. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, after this, I'm going to do a basic tutorial on uh, Postman, and then I do got to go. I'm going to get some lunch. Cool, yeah. <laughs> Deep says, I'm giving up. I can't get to it. No worries, no worries. <laughs> oh, you mean the, the link? Okay. Uh, no, so all of these are deployed servers. So uh, http-example.now.sh, that's a server in San Francisco somewhere, I think. <laughs> um, uh, EasyCSS.now.sh, that's also another server, potentially. Uh, and then Imager is another server. So there's multiple involved here, yeah. All right, is anyone else working on a diagram? All right. Let's see. Uh, take a chance. Has taken a chance at it. Here we go. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so... Um, we see just one request and response. So the interesting thing about this is there are actually three requests and three responses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is anyone else going to give it a try? Because I'll, I'll wait before I give my answer if anyone else wants to give it a try. And I mean, there's not one right answer. <laughs> I mean, um, 
Because what you drew here, um, oh, I guess you are showing like three requests. Okay, but I don't see the arrows. I see, I see. Um, but if you showed the arrows, that would be good. But I would still want to see the request line for each request. Um, and then we actually do get back multiple responses. All right, so let's see what Doc did. Hey. <laughs> it's looking more like it. Okay, so uh, let's look at Doc. So first, um, we make a GET request uh, to http.example.now.sh. Great. So th this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful solution, Doc. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna look we're gonna have to make our way down and make sure everything looks good. But basically, this is what's happening. So because this this web page is hosted at http-example.now.sh, that's where the first request goes to. Um, so that very first request goes to here, and that will respond with a bunch of HTML text. And that, that's what's important to note, right? When you're making a request to a website, it doesn't kind of just happen all at once. These are multiple requests. So the first request will actually respond with this HTML. And then the browser has to actually parse and understand this HTML. And then when it reaches this line, it says, oh, you need a CSS file. Well, I need to go request that. And that is in turn another uh, HTTP request. So um, the browser interprets it and it sees that link and it's like, hey, I need that CSS file. So I'm going to make a request to the host at easy-css.now.sh. And that's just a GET request. Easy-css.now.sh is going to respond with the actual CSS contents. Um, and so if we look in the network tab, we can see that responded with some CSS, and the browser knows what to do with CSS. It like basically applies that to the DOM. Great. Um, but while it was parsing this thing, um, it was like, okay, that's good. All right, now I'm going to show an H1 on the page. That's great. I'm going to show a break. Uh, now we need an image. And that image is at a totally another server, right? That image is at <clears throat> um, i.imager.com uh, slash some, some actual path. <laughs> Yeah, so the client is the one doing all these requests, not the server. Exactly, uh, and that's that's because like that's how the browser works. So the browser hits this, and uh, we can see in uh, Doc's diagram that um, it then makes that request. And you'll notice the path is not slash, right? In our other request examples, um, the path was just slash because we're requesting the root of the server. In this case, the root of the server actually responds with CSS, but that's another issue. Um, but when it makes this request. Um, um, you'll notice that the path is not slash. The path is 7bv2itl.gif. <laughs> and so uh, the imager server sees that response and it's like, oh, um, you, you were requesting an image. And it's good to note here that the response uh, headers are actually going to be content type image. Um, but yeah, there, there should be an arrow that actually responds with the actual contents of that, that image request. And let's see what the browser shows us. So if we look at preview, uh, it actually shows us the image. And if we look at response, uh, we're not seeing it. But uh, in actuality, if we look at it, the response headers are saying the content type is image slash GIF. And um, yes, that's a GIF with a soft G, not GIF, GIF. <laughs> but uh, Doc is saying it's missing an arrow. There, there should be an arrow there, yeah. Um, that's great. And so it actually responds with that image. The browser will then load that image. It, Jeff, Jeff, that's a good pronunciation. <laughs> but the browser, browser will load that image and actually show it on the page. Um, yeah, and that's a great point. And, and something that we actually don't see in this initial request here is uh, part of browsers are that they always attempt to request the favicon. So that's another request that happens. The browser will try to load the page and say slash uh, favicon.ico. Um, in this case, it responds with a 404, which is the client did something wrong. The client requested something that doesn't exist. Um, but typically, yeah, if I disable the cache, um, we should see that request, I think. Mm. Yeah, we're not seeing it. But the browser is technically making a request for that favicon to determine what icon it should show in the tab here. So with this one very simple website, there's actually a lot of HTTP requests happening under the hood. Um, and so it gets a 404 not found and then it doesn't show an icon. But emojis in the chat for Doc. This was a wonderful sequence diagram. Um, we could have technically shown that um, 
whenever it responded with the CSS, we actually need to show the body of the response. So the body of the response for this CSS file is all of the CSS contents, like the, the styles that are gonna be applied to the page. And the body of the request for this image request are the actual like bytes of the image. Um, and the body of the request for the home page are the actual HTML. So yeah, great job to doc. I didn't have to spend time making this because, because you did it. Um, but yeah, we, we could get a little bit more detailed. We could basically also show the contents of the body and really any other headers that it responds with as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so great, 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 great. And, and this all comes back to HTTP, <laughs> HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a way of transferring things over the web. The browser uses this like crazy and that's basically how web pages work. And every single web page works in this way. Um, putting the body requires web sequence diagrams premium. Okay, uh, no worries. Um, but yeah, someone mentioned, yeah, Steve, uh, Steven said, uh, look at the requests on Google. A lot of stuff happens when you go to google.com. So I'm gonna open the dev tools. We're gonna look at the network tab uh, and we are going to uh, request google.com. Look at all that. <laughs> so uh, the first request, um, is actually, so, oh, this this is good to show too. So because I just put google.com, it actually first defaulted to HTTP. Um, but part of the secure web is that everything should be over HTTPS. So Google actually responded to my re get request for HTTP that says 301, hey, this is moved permanently. You should actually go to HTTPS dot Google dot, uh, HTTPS colon slash slash Google dot com. So we can see in the response headers, um, a 301 response typically has a location header that says where you should be redirected to. So my browser saw that and then redirected me to HTTP dub dub dot Google dot com. Okay, so now we're here. here. <laughs> uh, and then we see, well, we actually need an internal redirect because we're still on HTTP. So my browser got that response and we can see that the response says the location should be HTTPS google.com. So then that redirects me here and that is a successful 200 status code. So there's a ton of response headers. We can see that the response has a bunch of HTML code and JavaScript. It has a bunch of things uh, linked in it. So it had a PNG file that it needed to, um, needed to request. Um, it had a font file it needed to request. There's another image file. Um, all kinds of things needed to happen just to load this one web page. Cool. So I think that's where I'm going to end it for this lesson on HTTP. Like has been said in the chat, and like I've mentioned, you can go a lot deeper than this. This is just really scratching the surface level of HTTP. Um, and it's really most of what you need to know to uh, work within the confines of HTTP when you're developing web applications. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, feel free to throw questions in the description of this video. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, join our Discord if you have more questions that maybe need more conversation. But thanks for watching. Cool. Yeah, and that's the other thing uh, Doc is mentioning. So not only is it making these requests, it's also doing DNS lookups because uh, it doesn't just know where google.com is or know where www.google.com is. It actually has to hit the DNS to um, say, what's the IP address so that it can then make the request there. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, take a chance. Glad you got to tune in. Um, no, this, what you're watching right now will be edited down into a video, but you, this will also be a video that you can watch the whole thing of if you wanted to. Cool. All right. Um, I, I think that's all I'm going to talk about. I did in the title of, of this, I did say I was going to talk about Postman, but I've been live for close to three and a half hours and I need to get some lunch. So I think this is good. I think this is a really good basis for understanding the parts of HTTP and how it applies to being a web developer. Um, the next part and the, and the next place we'll go, I'll, for those of you that are watching now, I'll talk about it, but I am going to do a, a totally separate lesson and video on this. But there, <laughs> yeah, I did, I really, I said it was going to be an hour, didn't I? Um, but there are tools like Postman, which let you uh, further break apart the request and, and change and modify the request. So with Postman, you can make HTTP requests. So let's actually just do this real quick with the example page that I created. So in Postman, um, I can say, I want to make a GET request to that URL. Um, I can specify query params. So we didn't talk about query params, but query params are the thing that comes after the question mark. So I can say like, um, 
search equals hamburger. Um, and you'll see that that shows up there. But uh, Postman allows me to specify these query params. I can specify uh, basic auth, bearer token auth. The headers tab lets me put the keys and the values for each uh, header so or each, uh, each thing. So here I could actually say um, the host is HTTP uh, dash example dot now dot sh. Um, Postman is actually going to add that automatically for me, but these keys and values, I can add any headers that I want. Um, the body of the request is what gets sent to the server, but remember, get requests don't have a body. Um, so Postman is a tool that really lets you break it down and, and really uh, create HTTP requests with all these different parts and pieces. You can specify all of these different methods, um, but then if I click send, I should get back the HTML contents. I do. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about Postman is it's not a browser. So it's not automatically going to parse this and make the request for the CSS or parse this and make the request for the image. It's just the initial request and it shows me the response. Um, though if I click visualize, um, or if I click preview, yeah, it actually does load it. <laughs> and you better believe that behind the scenes, it needed to request the CSS file. It needed to request the image, all of that good stuff. Um, but you can also inspect the headers of the response any cookies that got set in the response. You can see the status code, how long it took. So Postman is a really cool tool for working with HTTP, but like breaking everything down and, and really debugging requests and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so there's Postman. Um, post women, uh, Postwoman is a new thing that I just learned about, which seems pretty cool. It works in a very similar way, but it's inside of the browser and it has a cool name like Postwoman. <laughs> um, and there's also um, Insomnia which is also a very similar tool that lets you do these types of things. You can define the body of the request, you can define the headers, you can define the, um, the method, the URL, all, all of that good stuff. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, no worries, drills. Cool, and, and shout out again to Doc for creating this diagram so I didn't have to. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna end it there. Thanks everyone for tuning in, like I said, uh, I'm going to edit this video down. So for those of you that are just now tuning in, you're, you won't have to watch a three and a half hour stream. Uh, this will probably end up being like maybe a 30 minute video, 30, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, basically we didn't use Postman or Insomnia or, uh, or Postwoman. Um, we just talked about HTTP, but that's for a future video. All right. Uh, let's raid someone cause that's always fun. So if you're watching on YouTube, please go to twitch.tv slash coding garden. I'll let you go there now. Um, yeah, come on over to Twitch and we're gonna raid another channel. So let's see who we're gonna raid. Um, is Bonsai Baby live? They're not really doing any coding, but Bonsai Baby is fun. Um, she has a workshop and she builds stuff. She's really cool. Uh, CM Griffin is live. He's currently hacking the Gibson. Make any sense? <laughs> uh, let's look in science and technology and see who else is streaming. Viewers, hi to low. Um, Nahamsek, I've watched him before. We're not going to raid him, but uh, if you're interested interested in, uh, oh, Dev Wars is live. What? Dev Wars. So I've I've never got to tune in live, but Dev Wars is a really cool stream where basically you have different teams competing together to uh, to build a website. Let's see. Shadowing. Change the song. Okay. Um, let's sign in. Oh, okay. did they change the password? Cool. So uh, we're not going to raid Dev Wars, but that's really cool. Check out Dev Wars if you haven't seen it before, because it's like a live hackathon thing. Um, oh, yeah, but uh, Nahamsek actually does... Um, uh, penetration testing and um, bug bounties. So that's always fun to watch. Let's see, we're gonna find someone with a low number of viewers. Yeah, Alt F4 is live. We rated them before. They're building um, like a Twitch bot software as a service thing, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's me, hello. <laughs> yeah, I was there, that's me. <laughs> um. Uh, Ashuv is doing a Linux setup party. 
React and Gatsby from Illuminated Space. Yeah, let's see if anybody from the Live Coders team is um, is live. Oh, enable the drop game. Sorry. There you go. Um, Illuminated Space is on the um, Live Coders team. And then... Wait, where's that echo coming from? <laughs> Are they doing web development? Yep, uh, you can see the, the images that pop up there. Or if you, uh, it might be that Twitch is sets it as your gravatar, I don't know. Yeah, they are doing JavaScript, so they're doing React and Gatsby. They're listening to Synthwave, let's rave Illuminated Space, because <laughs> why not? Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, please go to uh, twitch.tv slash coding garden, um, and we are gonna do a good old fashioned raid, which is basically where we take all the viewers of my stream and we send them over to another stream. Um, so yeah, oh, this was fun though. Did I, did I miss any other chats? Cool. See you later, Italian football. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the follow, Kevy. Yeah, did I miss any other? I probably missed a lot of follows, but let's see. Thanks for the follow, follow Flipper. Thanks for the follow, Take a Chance. Thanks for the follow, and uh, Business. Thanks for the follow, Italian football. Thanks for the follow, Cosmic Ishan. Thanks for the follow, Shakodes. Thanks for the follow, Copa Europka. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the follow, Nasiel. Thanks for the follow, follow Profel. Thanks for the follow, El Eloden Mark. Thanks for the follow, Celtic. Thanks for the follow, uh, Lindbergh. Thanks for the follow, I Dave You Everything. Thanks for the follow, Hippo. And thanks for the follow, Kevy. Um, also, huge shout out to all the people that sent uh, tips and super chats. Thanks to Brandon Ni Myers for the $1.99 super chat. Thanks to Cedric for the... Uh, Six, seven, eight dollar super chats. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Casual Gameplay for the thirty dollar donation. Much appreciated. Not required, but appreciated. I appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and hello, Jimmy. We're about to head out, but thanks for tuning in. Alrighty. Um, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this. Mm -hmm.